watching closely. What's the secret, Max? You just gotta find something you love to do and then do it for the rest of your life. I don't want to be a product of my environment. I want my environment to be a product of me. Welcome to The Establishing Shot, a podcast where we do deep dives into directors and their filmographies. I am your host, Eli Price, uh, and we are here on episode 38 of the podcast. And uh, yeah, we're pretty early on in our Steven Spielberg, early Steven Spielberg series covering his movies of the 70s and 80s. And we're covering a big one today, Jaws. Uh uh, I would take the the low hanging fruit and say we're going to need a bigger podcast, but uh, <laughs> but I, I've actually heard it done on other podcasts, so I'm not going to do that today. But <laughs> I have a, a new guest joining me today. Uh, Daniel Blackaby is uh, is here with us. He uh, runs um, a uh, I guess you would call it sort of a uh, pop culture and uh, Christianity ministry. Uh, called The Collision, uh, among other things. But uh, I'm excited to have Daniel on to talk about what uh, what I gather is his favorite, if not one of his favorite movies. <laughs> is that right, Daniel? Oh yeah, this is this is uh, this is my jam. This is this has been <laughs> my favorite one for a while. Okay, great. Uh, well, yeah, I'm I'm excited to have you on, uh, Daniel. Why don't you tell people a little bit about uh, who you are and and what you do? Yeah, for sure. So Daniel Blackaby, and like you said, kind of the the main thing I do um, is run the Collision, which, as you said, you know, is sort of a kind of a pop culture entertainment uh, ministry where we just look at everything going on in culture, uh, whether that's you know digging deep into movies or just trends or, or news or or whatever it is and just discuss them I kind of discuss it as as a movie I discuss it as someone of faith and kind of how that relates to to the film and uh, just trying to be um kind of engaged with what's happening i i love pop culture uh, i love books and, and movies and music so uh so it's just sort of been it's been a fun thing to sit we talk a lot about like cultural conversations so mm -hmm. just Kind of sparking conversations about these things that are happening and uh, so that's yeah that's been real good yeah yeah and i i've i've tuned in for for uh for some of the the episodes or or shows y'all have done i don't know if y'all necessarily call them episodes but uh but yeah and it's always a, a good discussion and um even if even if you know you're not yourself a christian uh the the conversations are are engaging and um and and interesting you know I would say even regardless as if you are a Christian, but, um, but definitely, you know, from a Christian perspective. So, um, that's, that's, uh, it's, I guess more unique than in the space than, uh, than the vast amount of, um, of media out there covering, you know, pop culture and film. Um, but yeah, so, uh, and, and you, and uh, you, with your brother and some without your brother do some writing too is uh did you want to plug anything as far yeah, as that well, goes yeah, yeah I'll, I'll always plug uh, <laughs> i can plug some stuff so yeah i've done uh on my own i've done some some fiction some novels uh kind of young adult fantasy uh type stuff um you know i've always been a, a literary guy i was an english major in college uh, so i do some of that and then my brother and i have an older brother and we do uh, various writing projects, uh, you know, mostly from like a Christian kind of religious perspective, um, but with a lot of angles of storytelling and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, kind of looking at life, the kind of the big questions of life, but through the lens of like Joseph Campbell's hero's journey or, um, you know, just looking at some of these sort of faith questions, but through the arts and through beauty and kind of some of those um, kind of the stuff that I think both of us are, are super passionate about. Uh, yeah. So we have several things so you can, uh, I'm sure maybe you'll drop a link or something to Amazon if you guys want to check out the, mm -hmm. uh, the different books, but, um, so yeah, I'm excited to do a lot of that too. Yeah, for sure. I'll, I'll definitely, uh, link to, 
link to a page that maybe maybe there's a page where it has like kind of all of your work um in one i can put that in the the show notes for for people to just click on it's easier than just saying like go to this link yeah. like no go in the <laughs> go in the notes and click on it it's easier um but yeah that's that's really awesome uh i'll uh i saw um a recent book y'all had i need to get it and and check it out uh it had it drew me in because there were like dragons or something on the cover. What was the name of that one? Yeah, so that's a uh, our most recent uh, one. It's called a uh, God Heroes and Everyday Dragons, and it's mm -hmm. sort of looking at just a lot of uh, questions of faith, but just kind of development and sort of life, um, but through the lens of uh, kind of the hero's journey and Campbell and kind of how yeah. the, the stories around us reflect kind of who we are as people and the way we're wired and you know the reason we're drawn to these stories again and again and again mm -hmm. is because i think like campbell would say like they contain spiritual truths and kind of human truths so kind of look at that, that was a fun one for us just to to nerd out and kind of look at different cultural examples and books and kind yeah. of what you know what can this help us understand about who we are as people who we, we are as people of faith and uh, kind of walk through you know, some of those questions so yeah, that one uh, came out, I think it was last October. So that's our most recent project. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've seen it and uh, it's it's on my radar. I need to go ahead and add it to uh, to the wish list on, on Amazon <laughs> <laughs> so that I don't forget about it. Um, but yeah, I'll definitely link to those. Uh, but yeah, why don't you uh, tell us about... Um, as you as you sip from your Jaws mug, <laughs> why don't you tell us about uh yeah, just your introduction to Spielberg. Do you remember the first Spielberg you ever saw? I'm trying to think it's it a might hard not, question sometimes. Yeah. yeah, it might not be accurate. I think it was Jurassic Park though, like the first one, at least that I have a memory of. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know how old I was. I know I was pretty young. I can young enough where it like was scary <laughs> like yeah. you're, you know, you're kind of terrified but i remember it because we it was like a i think my uncle or someone had like taped it on like a vhs mm -hmm. like off the tv like you know so i think even like the first like the opening of that when they're like trying to rail in the the raptor and the like he, he hadn't recorded that part so it was like years later when i see like the actual <laughs> i'm like wait there's like more to this movie than you know than i, than I thought but i remember watching that I think with him and cousins, like in his basement and like, you know, just thinking it was, you know, so cool. I know that. And then probably E.T. was mm -hmm. another one that I, I have like early memories because I used to be terrified of like the, the guys, like the suits, like that come that contain like contamination kind of guys that, yeah. I don't know why that, that visual, like to me was this horror. And like, when they're coming into the house to get the kid, like, like I yeah. was like, horrified of that. Like I thought it was like the scariest thing ever. Um, yeah, so those are probably the two earliest that like, I have memories of uh, watching. Yeah, that's cool. It's funny because I'm pretty sure when I did the my overview episode, I, I'm pretty sure I talked about those two as being my like earliest memories. Kind of a similar thing. They're kind of fuzzy. I'm not sure what came first, but yeah, ET and Jurassic Park definitely were. Were you were pretty kind young of, when you? Yeah, so I was born in 91, so I wouldn't have seen Jurassic Park like in, you know, theaters or it it would have been later on, but it it might have even been Jurassic Park like the second one that I saw. Uh I was pretty young uh cuz I remember my grandma either showed it to me at home or like took me to see it and uh my parents were like upset with her because <laughs> i was too they thought i was too young but then like i loved it and like i loved dinosaurs so it's like oh it worked out you know um but yeah it's uh it's funny do you remember the first time you saw jaws i don't like i i, I sort of vaguely have memories but i yeah not enough to even remember who like, i'm guessing my dad you know like we weren't necessarily like we just we didn't watch a ton of movies growing up. Like we mm -hmm. weren't anti movie. Like my parents, we watched movies and stuff, but like neither of my parents watch movies really now. Like they just weren't like you know movie junkies or anything. Sure. So we would watch them from time to time, but like 
so I, I'm guessing it would have been him, but it, he wasn't like necessarily, you know, the kind of guy that just wanted to introduce me to all these classics. Like, like he showed me Star Wars and some of those, you know, some of the yeah. the biggies and stuff. But, but I sort of remember seeing it. I don't even know if it was the first time. Um, but yeah, I don't really have a memory of like even what my thoughts were. You yeah, know, the first time, like I, I'm sure I didn't appreciate it like I do now because it's right. Oh, it's a scary movie with sharks, like. No, but yes, yeah, so I don't really, I don't really know what the first time. Do you remember your first? Yeah, yeah, I actually watched it. Um, that it, I was a, I, it was only a few years ago. I'm pretty sure I watched it in the middle of COVID for the first time. Oh no way! Um, yeah, so it was. Um, it's just one of those things where there's there's just so many you know films, so many films, and even like when you get into film. It's like, oh, I still haven't seen this and this and this and this. There's just too many to catch up with. And uh, and yeah, Jaws was one of those where I think I think it was like, I think 2020 would have been like the 45th anniversary of it. And there were some like people like posting like, oh, 45th anniversary of Jaws. And I was like, oh, I'm going to watch Jaws. I've never watched it before. Um, and you know, we're all stuck at home. So I guess perfect time to, uh, watch when you're far from the beach and stuck at home is the perfect time to watch it <laughs> for the first time. But yeah, that was the first time I ever watched it. Um, so it's, uh, it's not a movie that like I have a long history with, which I know a lot of people do. Um, but it, I also like really love this movie. So <laughs> But, uh, yeah, um, you, so it, is this, would you say this is like your favorite movie or is it, or do you just say like one of my favorites? I would probably say it's my favorite, but I, yeah, with the like asterisk caveat that I, I, I almost consider like the original Star Wars trilogy and like mm. the Lord of the Rings trilogy is like, and even like the Harry Potter movies is like a separate category of sure you know, like those are sort of big franchise because we watch like me and my wife at least probably twice a year we watch through the lord of the rings movies and then mm. the harry potter movies and then i like, mean my kids will watch star wars like the original ones and and like the, yeah the, the original star wars were like the first non-cartoon movies that i ever saw like that was like mm. the day my dad's like, you know, boys will become men and we will sit down and you will not watch <laughs> cartoons. You're going to see the original Star Wars movies. Um, so I don't know if anything will ever like top that. Like there's such a right. nostalgia to like, I remember vividly watching the Star Wars movies and like where we were and what we did. And, and it was like a weird thing where my dad like only rented the first and the third and he like skipped over the second because he wanted to make sure we liked it. And so like I, never got like the Darth Vader surprise. Like it was spoiled for mm. me because I never got that movie until later. And I, so I, th I feel like those movies in a, in like a different kind of category, but, but like outside of those of just like an, a standalone movie, this would be my favorite movie. Like I, yeah. it's the movie that I'm probably the opposite of you. Like, like you were saying, you have so many movies to watch that it took you a while to get to Jaws. I'm totally the kind of person that, you know, I'll get like an evening free and it's like, there's all these movies I haven't watched. You know, we have like however many streaming platforms. I should watch Jaws again <laughs> and throw it back <laughs> on. And like, you know, I don't, I don't know how many times I've seen this movie, but it's, it's, it's yeah. a lot. So yeah, it's probably my, <laughs> my favorite is sort of standalone movie. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things where you have, you kind of have to have one to like pull out of the pocket when someone asks what your favorite movie is, even if like, there's not technically one. You still have to say something. <laughs> but in this, I, I would say Jaws is a good one <laughs> to to have uh, have in your pocket for for that answer. Um, well, what's yeah. funny? How many? Because it's it's not an uncommon like. Yeah. Like you see tons of people that will will reference Jaws as like their favorite. Like it's mm -hmm. maybe it's just that's the the kind of circles I'm around. <laughs> like I follow sure. the different pages that of the people that are big draws people, but, but it seems like a lot of people like, you know, it is a, you know, it's a go-to for, for people. I should say too, I just remembered, I don't, I don't remember the first time I saw Jaws, but I do remember, I think when I, I really got hooked on it, 
because I was, I was, would have been like a teenager or like first year of college. And I was working at like a, a real rundown, like video rental store like mm-hmm. back when they, those things still existed. And like, we could just take movies out for free. And like, I wasn't even necessarily a huge movie person, but I forget why I was, was going to be home alone or something. And like, I rented like, not just Jaws, but like all the Jaws, like, you know, yeah. Jaws 2 and I like, you know Jaws the Revenge and like, and I just marathon Jaws movies like all weekend. And nice. I just got so hooked. I mean, like, they get progressively worse as they go, but <laughs> I'm just so hooked into it. And I think kind of, I feel like I was at a good age then to like, I know I'd already seen it, but it'd probably right. be in a while, but it's kind of from then that it's like, oh, like, this is, this is some good stuff. Like, I can watch oh, yeah. this, you know, more often. Like, you know, I need to, so probably from then is when it like became like my favorite. Yeah. Movie. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. It, that's um it's so as soon as i saw this back a few years ago um now i have some like i have a few like pretty big spielberg blind spots that i'll be catching up with as i as i cover you know his movies but um but jaws like instantly jumped to the top of of his filmography for me um when i saw it i was like this is his best movie I, it's so good <laughs> Um, but, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of jump into, um, uh, kind of the making of Jaws. And this is, um, a quote that I got from Spielberg. Um, he said, when I think about Jaws, I think about courage and stupidity. Um, and that's, <laughs> that's, uh, kind of how he opens up, um, uh, the, the kind of making of Jaws documentary is with, uh, with that quote, um, so uh yeah he he has very Spielberg himself has very mixed feelings about about Jaws because for him um and a lot of the the cast and crew it was a very grueling uh terrible process of of production and and shooting and um and all that uh but you know he he always says he's he's very like appreciative of it because it it really is the thing that catapulted his career into what it is now uh but i just i thought that would be a good way to start off our our talk about jaws is because how old was he do you know he was so it was 74 was when they were shooting he was born in 46 so um so he was um what 20 26 27 i guess yeah, like I know he's in, he was like in his yeah. mid, like which is just crazy. To like, yeah, yeah, yeah twenty seven, I think, because um, he was or twenty eight. He was twenty four, I know, when Duel was made, and that was seventy one. And this came out. It was shot in seventy four, three years later. So yeah, twenty seven, um, which is crazy uh, <laughs> to think about um, that he. Yeah, it's just wild how how young he was. Um, and there was really like that whole bunch of his kind of him and his peers um at the time, like Lucas and Scorsese and De Palma and all those guys were just like so young and just like excited like making phenomenal movies like right off the bat, uh, which is crazy to think about. Um like they definitely had like just a incredible that's a that's an incredible generation of filmmakers for sure and there's still like that will never be top either like, and maybe yeah. quality, but like just the the idea of like a bunch of like 20 something year old mm-hmm. making these sort of out there like like nowadays everything's so like struck or at least a bit more structured and like you know very franchise and all these things that yeah the idea of some like 27 year old just out there making some big blockbuster movie is just, yeah it's crazy yeah for sure but yeah it all started with the peter benchley novel of the same name jaws um and we we had texted a little bit you've we've both read um this book you've uh how long ago did you read it do you do you remember yeah was like, it? like a month ago so like at the start of that oh, okay. i had already i'd bought it because i've been always meant to read it so i bought it and then when you asked asked to come on the podcast, like, oh, that's a good excuse to pull it off the <laughs> off the shelf and finally kind of work through it. And yeah, yeah, just because I'd always been curious. Yeah, and I I listened to the the audiobook version uh, 
And um, yeah, what what were your thoughts on the book? Um, I'm kind of a little uh, mixed myself, I guess you could say. On the yeah, the I mean, book. I thought I, that it's it's not good. Like, I don't think the, <laughs> and I don't. I, I feel like it's hard. Like, I'm so biased that I. Yeah. It's and a lot of the things. I can't, you realize a lot of the things I like most about the Jaws movie are the things that he changed from the book. Like yeah. The, the character dynamics and the, some mm-hmm. of the, the, so it's hard to be like, oh, like this book sort of is the reverse of that. <laughs> yeah. It takes the things I love about this movie and then it, I, I mean, obviously it did it first, but yeah. Experiencing it second, like, oh, I got you. I kind of, I kind of hate all these, like, none of these characters are likable. And like, which is yeah. one of my favorite parts of the movie, like this, the dynamics and, Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, like it's fine for like a pulpy, you know, like right. it has some fun and scares or whatever. But, mm-hmm. but I just I even found, yeah, I even found like the suspense parts to be really like dull. Like I never felt like my heart beating faster while I was listening to it, or you know, I mean, and I you get that when you read like Harry Potter, and it's you know written for kids. And I'm like, but this guy can't re- write like a shark thriller that like gets my heart pumping. And I was just, kind of, I was kind of like, yeah, I don't know if this book is very good. I, I guess it was just kind of like a, one of those things where it's like the right time that came out at the right time in the summer and people grabbed it on their way to the beach or vacation and easy read. And it became a bestseller, I guess. I don't know. It's, it's kind of. Yeah, I read it, and and too like the the like you said, none of the characters are like mostly unlikable. Like the wife isn't very likable. Hooper isn't very likable. Um, I guess Brody kind of is, but definitely less so than in the movie. <laughs> yeah, so. definitely less Hollywood eyes. Like he's not really the hero. And I feel like one of the difference too with the book is that, like, kind of like you said, the shark stuff is almost an afterthought. Like. Yeah, it's, it's really more about like, which I think even like in the book that I read, like there's like the prelude or whatever from the author, and he sort of says like it's it's really about like the island and like what the mm-hmm. shark does and like you know and how people respond to that and it's the sharks is sort of there to like spark a lot of these like tensions on off mm-hmm. you know, on the island and which I mean you can understand the appeal of that, but. But you just with Spielberg though, like the shark is really the yeah. Like you get some of the the stuff off the island, but most of it is is driven by just this sort of ever present fear of the shark. And where the book, yeah. you can go like whole chapters and like almost forget you're reading about a shark book. Like it's mm-hmm. like you know, there's no mention of it, or like it's yeah, for sure. Yeah, he so like the main things he took out um, were. Like a, a lot of the, I guess the, the major like bird's eye view story points are still there, um, with some tweaks, you know, along the way. But he did take out some like major plot points from the book. So there's like the affair with Hooper and Brody's wife, um, which is, I don't, know, it gets, it's a little too raunchy for my taste. Um, uh, you know, I. I know there's a a big market for for those (laughs) romance novels out there, but it's, it's not, not for me. Um, And uh, so I, I did appreciate that that he took all that stuff out of the movie, but then you also have like the really like kind of overwrought mafia stuff with the mayor, like the mayor's kind of like caught up with the mafia and yeah, all his motivations are very much. Yeah kind of self-serving like his own mm-hmm. investments um yeah it, it's just like it's just weird it's like okay the mayor's caught up with the mafia what like what <laughs> okay you know it's it's just all strange to me in the book um but yeah i'm i think um i think spielberg did like the first because re- they did the they got the original script written by Benchley. Um which I didn't they actually that. bought um yeah. Yeah, so Zanuck and Brown, they they were probably best known like 
not known because people don't really know producers. Um, but uh, if you were in the know, they had just made The Sting, which was a big movie. Um, star, it starred Robert Shaw. Um, so that's kind of his connection, how he ended up uh, coming on uh, to the film. But they actually bought the rights to the story uh, before it was published. Um, and they bought it for $150,000, which, <laughs> which eventually, um, in an interview was like, I thought I was like making out big time selling, <laughs> selling the book for 150,000. Uh, and, uh, yeah, little did he know that it was going to go on to be like the biggest movie of up to that point, you know? Uh, but yeah, he, they, um, they had the rights, um, and they, Spielberg wasn't the first consideration. They, they wanted to have um, John Sturgis make it um, who directed like the Magnificent Seven, the Great Escape. Um, some of those uh, really kind of big epic movies from, uh, from not, not far before another director, um, which if you watch like the making of documentary, they don't mention who this director is, but the, the book I'm reading, which if you're watching, you can kind of see is like right up here over my head. Um, uh, Spiel, uh, Steven Spielberg, all the films, it has the name of the director. So I guess at some point in time, the name of this director has come out. Um, the reason they didn't mention his name is because they, they didn't hire him because he kept mixing up well and shark. Um, <laughs> like he kept saying like, Oh, I've really always wanted to make a good well movie. And they, <laughs> He ended the, ended the interview and they're like, well, this guy, we can't give it to this guy. Um, his name was Dick Williams, um, which I thought that was such a funny, funny little anecdote. Like, oh, I really want to make a well movie. It's like, well, we're not making a well movie. Or a Moby Dick remake. Or... Right. <laughs> uh, but um, but Spielberg, actually, um, he had gotten a hold of the, the story himself. He, um, he had... I guess kind of heard through the grapevine somewhere that they were going to be making this and he was interested in it, but also kind of like not sure if he wanted to do it uh, because he, you know, he had just made dual uh, which is a very similar kind of premise of a beast like truck um, terrorizing um, kind of a, a everyday man in his car uh, so it's kind of that a s similar sort of like little thriller, um, you know, beast versus man kind of thing. And then the Sugarland Express was, was a little different, but also still kind of, a yeah, I think, I think he was just wary of like not getting pigeonholed as a director of, oh, I make this sort of movie. Um, but he did end up getting hired. They hired him in, in June of 73. Um, he rewrote the script from um, Benchley himself at first. Um, but if you like wa listen to interviews, he he's like under no pretense that he's a good, like a very good writer. Uh, and so he was like, you know, I wrote this, or rewrote it because, you know, we didn't like a lot of the Benchley stuff. And so I rewrote it, but I wanted to have like someone like good at writing to come on and help me. Um, so it, it kind of went through a couple of different things. Um, they, um, they brought on a guy named Howard Sackler who they pretty much everyone credits with, um, originating the idea of the, uh, USS Indianapolis speech. Um, so thankfully they, they had brought him on. He wasn't, he didn't want credit cause he didn't do a, a whole lot of work on it. Um, but yeah, and then they eventually brought on Carl Gottlieb who um, is the credited writer for the movie and um, him and Spielberg, you could probably it, from what I gather from all the interviews and things I've read, you could probably actually like have them as co-writers um, because it seems like Spielberg really had like a lot of influence on, on the work of the writing for the, for the movie. Um, and, and like some of the scenes, like he, he's the one that, came up with them in his kind of rewrite, like the, you have the, um, like the scene with the, on the pier where the guys are like using the roast. Yeah. Uh, like that was Spielberg's kind of, uh, in his rewrite. Um, 
there were some things he took out that I thought would have been interesting. One was kind of an introduction to Quint and he was going to have him in like the local Amity theater watching Moby Dick and like laughing maniacally, like more like louder and louder and like driving people out of the theater (laughs) as he just like laughs maniacally and hysterically at the movie Moby Dick. (laughs) So that would have been interesting. Um, You just feel like it was too on the nose. Like, well, I think they couldn't get, I think he said they, yeah, I think he couldn't say they couldn't get the rights to it uh, for some reason or another. Um, the guy that had the rights to it, which who was, he was either the director or the, or uh, like the main actor in it, um, wasn't like all that proud of it, uh, as a movie. And so he didn't really want to like, <laughs> he didn't want it to come across as like they were making fun of it. And he's also already like self-conscious of it. <laughs> so, so he didn't like sell them the rights, uh, which I guess makes sense. Um, the other like really cool scene that he talks about that they didn't end up using. Um, I guess I think it was because it would have been part of it would have been redundant. They were just trying to like cut out, like trim the fat on how many like kills they were going to do. Um, but this one, he had like this idea for a scene where like you're, there's a guy on a, on a pier or something and you're looking out and there's a bunch of sailboats kind of out in the water and you can kind of see the sailboats like kind of sway out of the way as kind of a visual of the shark approaching. And then he like comes up and gets the guy like pulling up a crab trap or something. Um, and I was like, Oh, that would have been a really cool visual like moment to add, but, but yeah, we didn't get that one. So, um, but yeah, they, uh, they really like they really had to like get moving on this cuz there was like an impending actor strike that was a possible possibly coming up um so they were trying to like get started before that got going and they wanted to like line it up with the release of the paperback the the release of the movie um and so they like pressured him to get going on it even though they didn't have a completed like finalized budget and they didn't have a completed uh script uh so they really started working on this like without even kind of knowing what they were what they were in for which is wild to think about but hi quick reminder that you yes you can be a huge help to the production of this show if you visit establishingshotpod.com slash donate You'll find out how to join the Establishing Shot family through some giving tiers starting as low as $5 a month. You heard that right, only $5 a month. And not only will you be helping me keep the show going, but you'll also get some perks yourself like early and ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, access to a Discord server where we can chat it up about the show and movies in general, and more. I might even let you choose a movie for me to review for the show. Check out that link in the show notes to learn more. Back to the show. Well, before I guess before we get into the production, let's talk a little bit about the cast. Um, who would you say is like your is like the in this movie? If you had to pick one, who is like the perfect cast uh, casting choice? I mean, I feel like the 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 holy trinity of the three. Right, are all just great. Like I think Hooper's always been my favorite. I just, hmm. I love his, you know, his. I, I feel like he brings a lot of humor and just energy to the. But I mean, Brody is just like a good classic Hollywood, yeah, kind of hero. Like he's, you know, he's mm-hmm. capable, but he's, you know, and he's funny. And I mean, Quint is probably. I would feel like everyone's like least favorite, but. But I feel like that's by design. Like I feel like he the the casting of Quint, like he's awesome. Like he's barely yeah. you know he's in it way less than you know it's like like an hour into the movie before he really joins the, mm-hmm. the cast. But he makes such an impression. Like he, you know, just all his his little sayings and songs. Like he he just so embodies that kind of crazed Captain Ahab kind of character. Oh yeah, that 
yeah, the, the three of them, like I know, which we'll probably get into, like maybe off camera, they maybe didn't have as much chemistry all the time. Sure. But like on, you know, like in the movie, like they they work so well off each other mm. that it's this real perfect casting. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, they um, for yeah for Dreyfus uh, the for the if, like so the story goes for him that uh, Lucas recommended um, him to Spielberg. Uh, they were buddies and he was in American graffiti. And so he recommended him and they met with Dreyfus. Uh, they wanted him for Hooper. Um, and he like turned it down at first. He, he did, he thought it was like a movie that he would like watching, but maybe wouldn't be very good acting in. And he just like, wasn't really too sure about it. And, um, then like it's funny because in the the making of documentary he he tells this story himself uh and he's like and then i saw he it, i think the movie was um i have it written down uh the apprenticeship of duddy kravitz which i've never seen um but it was a movie that was releasing that he was the star of he was kind of the lead and he said he saw his performance in that and was like I've got to get another job right away. He, he, <laughs> he wasn't too proud of that performance, I guess. And uh, he called Steven Spielberg up and the way he says it is like, I basically like begged Steve Spielberg to like, it let me have the part if it was still available. Um, so I thought that was a funny, a funny little anecdote about Dreyfus getting the part. But yeah, he, he really is. Dreyfus to me brings, um, like it, so if you think about that trio um if it's just Brody and Quint um it, it's just not the same movie um he just brings that like there's like a youthful energy that he brings that i feel like is so necessary for that that dynamic um and it's even like this like where the scene where he's like driving the boat and Quint's banging underneath and yeah he's sort of like you know talking like aye aye captain like yeah <laughs> just those sort of stuff that like Brody can't really pull off the right that sort of you know the wit right this the, the more sharper sort of comedic stuff that mm -hmm. that I feel like just brings some like levity to you know and just if like you said some of that youthful energy to a movie that oh, yeah. could have been a bit more like straight. But yeah, I don't think this movie works the same way if you take out him from it. Yeah. And he also like he his relationship with Brody kind of apart from the ship, he he's got that like youthful. Like, I'm not caught up in in this system and I'm not like uh, I'm I'm young, like I'm not going to get caught like I don't have to like stand for this kind of energy that rebel young rebellious energy i guess and he's like willing to say stuff that like brody's like too um i guess like afraid to say uh because it might cost him something and dreyfus's character like dreyfus as hooper is just like no i'm gonna say that i'm gonna tell the mayor to his face that he's <laughs> like an idiot you know <laughs> um so i i appreciate that too um for for chief martin brody um one of the things i um i thought was really like surprising was that charlton heston actually like wanted the role he like went put himself forward for the role of of chief brody and spielberg kind of had this idea that he didn't want like superstars in the movie because he felt like it would like steal the show from the shark. <laughs> and so he turned Charlton Heston down, <laughs> which again, he's a 27 year old director, early director. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, uh, Oh, Charlton Heston wants to be on my movie. Oh uh, no, no, he's not good for the part <laughs> and just turns him down. Um, and I think Heston like, swore him off and was like, I'm never going to be in a Steven Spielberg movie, which um, probably at the time was like, you know, probably a, a bad news for Spielberg, but like in hindsight, it, it probably ended up being bad news for, for Heston <laughs> um, to not be in a Spielberg movie. Uh, I just thought that was crazy. Um, the other, other person that um, they had, they 
that that had declined, I can't remember why, was uh, Robert Duvall. They were going to give that the role to him. Um, and it's kind of hard to imagine not Roy Scheider who ends yeah. up getting the role as Brody because he has that. I don't know. I feel like um, Heston and Duvall are maybe like too magnetic of like personas and Brody's supposed to kind of be like a everyman, like a, you know, he's in charge, but he doesn't feel like he's in charge kind of guy. <laughs> yeah. There's um, always like an, kind of an, almost an insecurity to his yeah, yeah. character. Like he's sort of always yeah. the outsider, like just not going to step forward that, but yeah, someone with like a more, especially someone that you recognize as typically being more in like a leading kind of, I mean, it would just be a different character. It would just be yeah. a bit more of a kind of sort of, but because yeah, yeah, Snyder very much is like you said, the everyman. Like I feel like he, of the three, like he's the only one that like, he has family and he has kids. He's sort of the the heart or like the attachment that yeah. for the audience, like you're invested in. You know, there's like the crazed kind of seaman, and then there's like the young kind of you know preppy boy, but then Brody's like the he's sort of like our guy like he's the oh yeah you know, he's he's in over his head like you know both the other guys he doesn't know how to work a ship he doesn't really know how to do anything useful on the ship like but he's just gonna you know do what he can oh yeah 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 Scheider just like he met Spielberg at a party and um the way he tells it is he like overheard them talking about Jaws and then like went up and met Steven um, and then like, as he was walking away, they started like back into their jaws conversation. And he was thinking like, these guys are a little loopy. Like what kind of movie are they talking <laughs> about? And then, um, he, uh, he talked with Spielberg more and, um, later on and Spielberg was like, we can't find anyone for this role. And Shire was just kind of like, you know, I, I could do it. And Spielberg was like, oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> and that's kind of how he got there. It, it's so funny. Like how like these stories of how people get cast. Sometimes it's just like, Oh, I wanted this guy. I called him and he said, yes. But then you get like stories like these with Dreyfus and Scheider that are just like, well, so many like, what yeah. is like this these yeah. chance encounters? And then they end up with these like iconic roles, but yeah. Um, which, uh, a, f a fun thing about Scheider, um, is so one of the things that Spielberg, I think that worked so well about this movie is, they were constantly like him and Gottlieb were constantly reworking the script as the movie went along. And so because of that, there, you know, the cast was getting, you know, scripts for the day. Sometimes like it was the first time they were seeing it. And so Spielberg kind of allowed for a lot of like improvisation and um, kind of making things your own. And so the, probably the, the most iconic line from the movie is probably we're going to need a bigger boat um and that was just there it is on uh on your jaws <laughs> mug and uh that was improvised by uh roy scheider um it wasn't like written in the script or anything he just kind of came up with it uh in that moment which, which is really uh, kind of interesting about that that i never i just i read it in a uh, i don't know if you've heard of this book called you talking to me and it's it's a recent book but it's it just analyzes like the 50 like most iconic lines in movies. And it gives like the mm. history behind like the, how did that, you know, how was it in the script? Like, how was it, you know, how did it come about? So they have, yeah. the, we're going to need a bigger boat. So I was like reading through that. And apparently at least according to this book, um, that that line, like had already become sort of like a joke, like the, that the, the cast, like the crew. Gotcha. Cause they were using like a cheap, kind of boat with the film and it just wasn't big yeah. enough to do that they kept sort of harping on like we're going to need a bigger boat and i think eventually they did like upgrade the boat they were using in the sea and stuff so i think like when at least if, if that's true like in the moment you know schneider pulls out sort of this running gag that the has been going around and then it just works so perfect like in the context yeah. of you know of that moment well, he delivers it so straight, it, which is surprising if it was like kind of an inside joke for the crew, like the crew. Uh, but he delivers it so straight. And it's like, I wonder if they like he was just kind of like laughing it off, like, oh, let's 
take again. And they're like, no, that was perfect. <laughs> you know, uh, that's, that's crazy. Um, the other, like, I guess of the trio would be Shaw, which we've touched on already, um, as Quint, Robert Shaw, um, they, they had wanted, uh, Lee Marvin for this position, for this, uh, who the, the only thing I've, I recognized a few movies that he's in, but the one that stood out was, um, he played Liberty Valance in the man who shot Liberty Valance, um, which I don't know if you've ever seen that, but, uh, I could definitely see um, Liberty Valance is like this, like really vile uh, character. And so when I, when I heard that, I was like, Oh, okay. That like, I could see maybe that. Um, And they had some other, other people they were interested in, but, um, but Shaw had the connection with the producers and they ended up going with him. And his role, I think is the one that it feels the, the most to me, like, I don't know if it would have, I don't know if anyone else could have done it. Like he did it sort of role. Like you could maybe see some other people doing Brody and Hooper like similarly, but uh, like Shaw as Quint feels like, man, I don't know if anyone else could have like pulled that role off exactly like him. Well, Um, I feel like it's a role that could very, like very easily come across cartoonish like yeah like someone trying to i'm the crazy captain and like you know just all his little songs and yeah you know like the the random sayings and like but like just the way he delivers all of that it never at least to me like it it never feels like some hokey like oh like here's the cliched crazy captain that wants to get the big fish kind of guy like it just he he sells it so straight like oh yeah you believe it like you believe he's this sort of guy that you know, and, and he brings enough, I think, which we'll probably, I'm sure we'll get into his speech, but like, you, he brings enough like humanity mm-hmm. that he's not like a totally, you know, irredeemable, crazy guy. Like he, you, you get enough to grasp onto, to believe that like this guy's seen some stuff, like he's been through stuff, like he's had hardships, like he's been alone, like he's, he's a human, like he's not just this sort of funny kind of persona that he probably puts right. on. Like, but yeah, he, he's such a good. You know, in that role, he's perfectly cast. Yeah, and um, I almost wonder if, like, <laughs> when you like read stories about him, like off camera, I almost wonder if he was so good because he was a bit of a drunk off camera too. Which, uh, which ter- I think the person that you hear that uh, stories of getting the mo- the biggest brunt of that is Dreyfus. Um, apparently, like the the like berating of Hooper didn't stop when the camera turned <laughs> off. He just, he just kept berating him and like terrorizing Dreyfus like all the time. Um, the, my favorite story that I heard, um, I can't remember if it was Spielberg or who was telling the story, but there was a moment where like dry, uh, Shaw was basically like, daring Dreyfus to climb to the top of the mass and jump off into the ocean and like offered him like a thousand dollars if he did it and like kept up in the money and call like calling him all sorts of like names that I'm not going to say on the episode uh, because he wasn't doing it. <laughs> and I'm just like, what is, wh- who is this guy? <laughs> like he's like terrorizing this kid. Um, but, uh, but apparently Spielberg himself like stepped in and finally was like, listen, listen, (laughs) Shaw, he's not going to jump off the mass. Like we need him alive for the movie. (laughs) Um, So that, that was like, I guess like the biggest example of like, man, Dreyfus really got, uh, got the short end of the stick when it came to uh, the, the drunken terror of Robert Shaw. but yeah, he 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 really was perfect. The um one of the little anecdotes that I thought was really interesting um go it kind of goes back to that like improvisation thing. Um he he does the little line when they're like packing up the ship about like here lies Mary Lee um and you know he rhymes it with like something about her virginity and because 
of the bad record, you know, for this this vicinity. Yeah. So, uh, Spielberg, like after that, he like went up, he was like, that was great. Like, Hey, like, you know, let me know, you know, where you got that from. Cause we're going to have to see if we can get the rights to it. And, um, and Shaw was just like, Oh, I don't think we'll have to worry about that. I, I saw that on a, a tombstone in Ireland <laughs> <laughs> that was on someone, a person named Mary Lee's tombstone, apparently in Ireland, um, which is great. Wow. Yeah. Um, well, I had wondered how much of that was scripted. Yeah. All so he, little it was improvised. Was- but he remembered it from that tombstone, yeah. uh, <laughs> um, which is, it's just one of those things like actors that can like pull stuff out like that. It's just like so impressive to me. Um, that's just, I can't do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's, it's really good. That, um, other than have those, you seen, have you seen, I think his, his son, cause he passed away, but his son mm-hmm. has like a solo, like kind of Broadway show. Have you seen anything about that? Like it's like, I think it's called the shark is broken. Like, yeah, you know, I've heard about, I heard he, that like, embodies, he yeah. embodies like his father and it's just great. Like he, you know, he can, do, cool. he can, he can really pull off the character. I haven't seen the show. I've just seen interviews and stuff like about it. Okay. But, this, but he's keeping sort of that legacy. You know, he has the hat, he, he kind of dresses like him and then he like embodies Quint. Uh, but yeah. It's kind of cool to see that. Yeah, I heard that that was a thing. I'm I'm gonna have to like uh, look that up and see if there's any clips on YouTube of that because that'd be cool to see. Um, yeah, that's that's a that's a cool uh, cool little legacy, I guess, uh, that he gets to carry on. Um, other characters, everyone else is pretty like uh, I wouldn't say like on the sidelines, but definitely like secondary. Um, but like the roles are really well played. Um, Lorraine Gary is plays Ellen Brody. Um, who it, Lorraine Gary, Gary is actually the wife of Sid Scheinberg, who was a um, executive at Universal that really got uh, Spielberg's career off the ground. Um, so that's a cool connection. And she was one of the first ones he he cast um, uh, for the film. Uh, Murray Hamilton uh, played Mayor Larry Vaughn, and uh, he um, the the role I recognized him from was he played Mr. Robinson in The Graduate. Um, so I'm sure sure people recognized him from that. Uh, and and Spielberg actually said that was his like first and only choice for <laughs> for the mayor. Uh, so it's a good thing he he got him signed on. Carl Gottlieb is actually who's a writer. He was actually brought on as an actor before uh, they they you know hired him on as a writer too. Um, and he plays uh, I think he's Meadows, who I think is supposed to be like the reporter character. That, yeah, in the book he's way he's like a way more prominent. Yeah, role. yeah. Which um, which I, that I think that's one thing that might have been interesting to have a little bit more in the movie of that that character because he is an interesting character um, in the book um, as far you know as as interesting as they actually get in the book he's he's one of the more interesting <laughs> ones I think um, at least like his motivations are interesting at least um, but I guess like once Scott Lieb was like hired on as a writer, it kind of like his role got sidelined, but uh, it, it probably is for the best. Um, probably some like fat trimmed as far as that goes. Uh, but yeah, everyone else is just kind of like side people. The only other, um, the only other person I thought was like really interesting was the girl who plays Chrissy. That is the victim, the first victim. Um, she was just like a stunt woman. Uh, in a bunch of films and got hired on and like, she, she wasn't like real sure if like she could act very well, but um, she, I feel like she did pretty good for the part. And, um, and we can kind of talk uh, in, a, in just a bit about like how they pulled that scene off, which was really cool um, seeing how they did all of the, the stunt work for that. Um, but first, uh, as far as production goes, we should go back to the beginning because Zanuck and Brown really wanted to do most of the movie with live sharks um, before they 
uh, started working on the mechanical shark. And um, so the first thing they did was they sent a crew to Australia and um, they worked with this Australian couple who had done um, a documentary. Um, I can't remember what it was called off the top of my head, um, but uh, yeah, this Australian couple did worked with them uh, shoot, getting some like live footage of sharks. Uh, they, they were like, Oh, well, you know, the sharks we have are like 14 feet and it's not going to look as big as the shark that you want in the movie. Um, and so what Spielberg's idea was to make like a miniature cage, um, so that the proportions would look right with the smaller shark. And he like casted for uh, a little person to be, uh, in the, like the scuba diver in the cage. And he ended up like casting this guy that, um, had like gotten in a wreck outside of the studio. And, uh, he like came in and he was like, he like ran across the street and it was like almost late for the interview. He's like, Oh, I got in a wreck. And Spielberg was like, he kind of like was bleeding a little bit. And Spielberg was like, you're not supposed to leave the scene of the wreck. And so they sent him back and he came back and Spielberg just liked how, like how much he wanted the part that he like left his wreck to come <laughs> for the interview and hired him, which I thought was really funny, but yeah, they, they did actually, you can see in like the making of documentary, um, he was like not a trained scuba diver. So they, they really like probably should have gotten someone that had more experience with that. Um, but uh, yeah, he's in like the little like miniature version of the cage, and um, the sh but they they didn't get like very much good footage with the sharks. Um, with that, what they did get was because uh, when they left Australia, they weren't even sure if they had any usable footage, um, and they had started working on the mechanical shark. So, um, but when they got the footage back, they actually. Um, got this really great footage of one of the sharks he had like gotten stuck on something and was like thrashing around right. and like um so in the movie we actually get that footage but there was nobody in the cage um for that footage and so like in the movie like you'll notice like the shark like thrashing around and the cage is like getting tossed around and stuff um with no one in it and so they actually hooper was actually supposed to die in the movie, like he did in the book, but oh, yeah, in that, I about that. yeah. So in that, they loved that uh, footage. They got so much that they rewrote that part of the movie. So that Hooper got out of the cage before the shark, like really got going on it. Um, and so, which I think is so fun, like <laughs> so funny to me, like let's rewrite our whole end of the movie. Um, and they actually like went back out and like reshot some stuff with like, Hooper coming back up and them swimming to shore together and stuff. Um, that's funny. Cause that's yeah. kind of the movie like that. It does. Like that makes it like, if he dies, then mm -hmm. it's not the feel good. Cause I mean, Quint dies, but he's the one you're the least attached to. Right. But like kind of having the main two live and that sort of, you know, just their little banter as there's, you know, paddling yeah. back to shore together. Like I feel like having him die would just, it could be a bummer. Like that would change. Yeah, I know in the book that surprised me that he, like, I didn't know that he died in the book. And like, oh, yeah, I mean he's unlikable in the book, so it's not as the same. But right, but that's funny that that's what led to his character surviving. Yeah, this. they just like got this awesome got real shark footage, but and we want to use it, so let's rewrite the whole move, the whole end of the movie. <laughs> is that the only real life shark footage, or is there um, other? No, there's some more, there's some other sections like, um, it's more like, uh, you know, like insert shots and stuff here and there of, of like real shark footage they got. Um, but, um, uh, but there's so little shark in the movie, um, uh, like actually shown that like you, they didn't really end up needing yeah. a whole lot of like live shark footage. Um, I want to say there's like one other part where there's live like a actual like live shark uh being shown most of the rest of it other than that shark thrashing around with the cage um and then obviously you know it's the mechanical shark when he's actually like coming into the yeah. cage and Hooper's still in there um 
but yeah, there's just, there's not a lot of even mechanical sharks. So it's, it's, it, that's kind of like the, the happy accident of the movie is like the, the shark didn't work. And I guess along with it, the other happy accident is that like, they got that awesome footage that changed the end of the movie. Um, but yeah, that's, that's crazy to think about. Um, they, uh, they started shooting in like officially in 74 May of 74. Um, and, uh, Spielberg, uh, basically like insisted on shooting it on the actual ocean. Um, and I think he probably, I bet if you asked him, he'd probably like is proud of that decision and regrets it at the same time. (laughs) It probably follows suit with his feeling of like courage and stupidity that we, uh, we kind of started this discussion off with. Um, but, uh, they, they had wanted to maybe possibly do it in Jamaica cause it had such clear waters. Um, but they ended up uh, choosing Martha's vineyard, which, um, which I think is pretty like pretty common, like trivia knowledge of like, Oh, where was Josh Sharp? Martha's vineyard, you know? Um, it's a little island off the coast of Massachusetts, uh, and they chose it, uh, because the shallow water goes like way out from the island. Um, I think even to a point like where you're far enough out where you can't really like necessarily like see the shore and it's still only like 35 feet or something. And so Spielberg was like, well, I wanted to like, if we dropped them shark or something where it would be retrievable, but still, but he still wanted the, the effect of like, oh, we're in the middle of the ocean. Like you can't see the shore. Um, he just thought that would like make the audience say like, oh, why don't you just go back over that way? We see the shore over there, <laughs> like just go home. Um, so that worked out really well. Um, Martha's Vineyard though, like the, the people that lived there weren't like too receptive of having the film crew there. And, um, and there was like tons of red tape. Uh, like I want to say the, the scene with the big billboard, you know, um, where they're arguing with the mayor, they had to put that billboard up, um, that morning and do their shooting and then take it back down. Um, like as, as soon as they were done shooting, uh, just because the, I guess the, the government there or whatever was just like so strict on, on them as a film crew. They, they really didn't want them there. It seems like, um, and I, I bet they regret that now because I bet they get tons of like tourism of people like, Oh, let's go check out this place where Jaws was shot. Um, so I bet they embrace it now. I don't know that for a fact, maybe they don't, but I would be willing to bet they do. <laughs> would you go visit Mar- Martha's Vineyard if you were in Massachusetts well, to see well, where Charles was shot? I think it's, I think it was supposed to be this year, but I think for whatever reason it got postponed. There's like a 50th anniversary, like Jaws celebration there. Okay. Uh, like, and it's like, they've announced it. I think the dates are out. But they haven't announced the details, but it's supposed to be like a big, you know, gathering yeah there and like i'm sure they'll like show the movie on some big screen and i can yeah. tell all this stuff so i was i've been trying to to lay the hints down to my wife that that was like a good vacation to go yeah. to a nice place and then slip off to go uh have a little jaws party with a bunch of other yeah uh, strangers but yeah i have <laughs> that would be really cool i need to go there yeah, that would be really cool, actually. Are they doing it this year or next year? Because I, I think it, I think it's next year. Yeah, for the because it was released seventy five. Um, okay, so next year would be the yeah, the would be 50th. yeah, so for the fiftieth. Yeah, it's that would be that would be really cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they're definitely like uh, they're definitely proud of it now. <laughs> they weren't <laughs> at the time, apparently. Um, but yeah, they. Uh, the June 11th, um, is when they shot the, so, you know, they spent, I guess, I guess they spent like that first month ish kind of shooting, um, in studio and stuff. And the Indianapolis speech was like one of the last things they shot before they went out to sea. Um, and, 
the story for that is that Shaw for the first shooting was like, I guess he was thinking like, Oh, this is my chance to get actually drunk while we're shooting because I'm supposed to be drunk in the movie. But he was like too drunk to do the speech. Well, (laughs) and um, he's like, really felt ashamed and like called Spielberg up and was like, Hey, can you, you know, give me another chance. And so they shot it, reshot it the next day too. Um, But they ended up apparently using footage from both nights um, in the edit. Uh, So I guess they got some good drunken (laughs) stuff out of Shaw that first night. (laughs) Um, But man, that guy, he, um, he must've been a, must have been a he must have been a bit of a pain on set, I would imagine. Uh, but not as big of a pain as the the sh- the sh- Bruce the shark, <laughs> who was uh, the bane of everyone's existence. Not because he was a terrorizing mechanical shark, but because he never worked. <laughs> um, as as the story goes, um, yeah, do. Uh, did you know the shark was nicknamed Bruce? Is it? Yeah. Is it the? Is it because of his lawyer? Is that the? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's funny, like, because um, from what I read, like, his lawyer is like a really nice guy, so I don't really <laughs> understand why Spielberg nicknamed it after his lawyer. Um, and uh, and and I think in the the documentary, Roy Scheider was like, I refused to call it Bruce, uh, I guess, because he knew Spielberg's lawyer. Um, (laughs) But, um, but that got me to thinking like, is the shark in Finding Nemo named Bruce, like after the jaw shark? Um, Yes, I knew there was like a cartoon. I don't know if it was Shark Tale or Nemo or I know there was a shark called Bruce. And I think it's gotta be. Yeah. It's gotta be because of Jaws. Yeah, I, I have to imagine that they they definitely named the the Finding Nemo shark after the Jaws shark, which is um which is fun to think about that extended universe of the the shark that doesn't eat uh fish in Finding Nemo <laughs> becoming the maybe becoming later on the shark in Jaws. Yeah, um, he finally got his a taste of uh <laughs> people and he changed his too. Yeah. Um but yeah, the John Alves was the um the production designer and um he uh he was kind of like the head guy for the shark, but he he had a lot of people working with him on it. Um Bob Mate Bob Maddie was one of the main people who apparently came out of retirement to help and um he's apparent I don't I don't even know that I should have looked uh, up a picture of this um, or footage of it, but the the giant squid in 20,000 leagues under the sea um, is something that this guy made. Uh, and I, I should have looked it up. I just didn't think about it. Um, so I don't know if it like looks cool or not, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I know I've seen the movie, but it was a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so he helped with the shark. He um he had the idea to like attach the model to the mechanical arm. Uh, um so they built this, you know, rig with the shark on it. Um and I think it weighed like twelve tons, which is super heavy <laughs> for uh for something you're gonna be like using in the ocean. And they had like um different iterations of it, like they had a sorry. They had like a full size version, which like is self-explanatory. It's the whole shark. And then they had like a left version and a right version where like the other side was like hollowed out so that they could like get in there and like do like fix the like tubes and stuff if they needed to um, really easily. Um, and then of course, like they had like just the fin <laughs> for, for all that stuff. But, um, but yeah, it's really like, really like intricate like nylon and um neoprene foam like steel frame and all this stuff and then they use like a um pneumatic system which i guess is like using like pressurized air um instead of using a hydraulic system because they didn't want like the chance of getting oil or something um leaking in the ocean um so so they use like the pressurized air so there's like all these tubes 
going into like the different parts of the shark um, to make it like wriggle around and stuff and shift back and forth, which is uh, when you see like the making of like, have you ever been to the Jaws ride at Universal? In yeah. Florida? Yeah. So like when you see it like in person and then like also when you're like watching it move like out of the water <laughs> in the making of like it takes away like all of the, the scariness <laughs> of it. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's uh, I've also seen Spielberg like being interviewed like at Universal, like across from the Jaws ride like going on in the background and he's like it's it's worked better here than it ever worked for me <laughs> at martha's vineyard <laughs> um which is fun but yeah they didn't even test it until and they dry tested it uh in la where they built it and then shipped it across the country to martha's vineyard and never like tested it in the water uh until they got there ready to shoot um and it didn't work <laughs> Um, Dreyfus tells, talks about how, like, they had these radios, like, all over that, you know, they communicated with. And he said it's just, like, constant over the radio. Psh, like, the shark isn't working. Psh, the shark isn't working. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, he, um, I think it was, I think what I read was that it, they didn't get it to, like, work properly like to get it to pop out of the water until September. Um, so, I mean, that's like two months of being out on the ocean, like shooting <laughs> every day before you finally get the shark to like work like you want it to, which is just wild. But that like pain that the pain that the shark was, I think ended up being like the biggest strength of the movie, which is like, you only see the shark like when it really matters. Um, but I think what is it? Yeah, like, like four minutes, or I think the as far as like screen time of the shark, I like guess I think it's, I think it comes out to like four minutes or something like of like total screen time. Which oh, is wow. I would have guessed more than that, but I guess it makes sense. Yeah. Because like you see a brief that you pop up, and then mm -hmm. like I think I've seen that like you see the barrels and stuff, but it's yeah. really only like till the end, like when he's like on the boat, that you like yeah. see him. And yeah, that might not be that. That just seems to be the common like I haven't counted it, but four minutes is like what comes up most often if yeah. you look up on the. Um, yeah, that's one of those things where like nine out of like nine point nine out of ten people are gonna like guess way more than that um as far as minutes go like it feels like something you would just have to know to be able to guess that low <laughs> of a time for the the shark in the movie jaws actually being on screen <laughs> um but yeah that that makes sense because i'm curious too because like you always hear from that that like you know because the shark didn't work then they didn't show it mm -hmm. and that's become even like the template just for like all monster movies now it's just you know, yeah you hide the monster like that's sort of the thing mm -hmm. like, like i know some of it must have been improvised but i wonder how different it would be like i've always wondered how much spielberg was ever gonna because like so much of what works in the movie is like the suggestive like the visuals yeah. and, like, some of those clever you know the ways mm -hmm. he communicates it but like i feel like he probably still would have done a lot of that but yeah i just sort of wonder what the vision would have been like I haven't seen early scripts or anything like mm -hmm. did he was the shark ever going to be like very prominent or like how yeah. much did. Yeah, that's a good question because one of the things that like I took away from like watching this and like then hearing about, you know, all the stuff about the movie reading um, is that Spielberg really like this early on in his career um you know his third feature well his his only his uh second like theatrical released feature um like already seemed to have a really good handle on like what was needed in the movie and what wasn't um and so i almost wonder if like he would have made the movie with more shark, but then ended up cutting out like all the, all the extra like shark scenes because 
he really did seem like he knew exactly like what this film needed and what it didn't. Um, like with what he took out from the book, for like from the original like write up and what he added. And then even like things that he added that he ended up not doing because it would have been redundant or, um, you know, you hear him talk about like several things where he was like, well, I feel like um, I had this idea, but it felt like it would have been a bit too out of taste as far as like violence goes. Um, so it just seems like he had a really good handle on what the story needed to like be what it is. So I, I almost wonder if he would have like made a different movie, but then like cut it, cut it up so that it it didn't have too much shark in it. I don't know. Yeah. Cause it's like almost like a lot of the more modern, like monster creature movies, like the, like the King Kong Godzilla mm-hmm. type movies, like they're so spectacle and they're so, yeah, I just can't imagine like they're sort of the antithesis of, what jaws is like yeah more the you know building tension i guess more just here's a monster like or even just the jurassic park movies post spielberg are Mm -hmm. a lot more to sort of show the creature have them you know a lot of spectacle and i just have a hard time i mean i guess lost world kind of does that but Mm -hmm. hard time picturing spielberg making that kind of movie like i mean it might have been more shark if i guess if he could but I, i can't imagine it just losing some of those elements that like you know yeah like, like the person like, POV of the stuff. shark and stuff like yeah, there's a ton of like there's sort of genius stuff going on beyond just like necessity like i think spielberg mm-hmm. also just knows how to build tension without just sort of shoving a monster yeah. in front of the screen yeah and i'm like uh so have you seen have you ever seen duel which was uh, his TV first TV movie. No, I don't even know that that existed until you mentioned it. Yeah. So it is, um, yeah, it's this, you know, and you can go back and, uh, you know, if you're listening to this and you're like, Oh, I'm interested in that. Um, I did an episode on that, um, as well that is already out there, but it, um, it's basically like this guy that's just on his way to like a business meeting kind of driving through. It feels like, uh, I think it's like San Fernando Valley, California. So like desert road highways. And there's just this giant tanker truck that is like terrorizing him and like keeps popping up and like trying to run him off the road. Um, and the tanker truck is in there a lot, but he, he does keep the tension up. But at the same time, it's like the tanker truck is an actual like tanker truck with a stunt driver in it. It's not a like, fairly fake looking mechanical shark so (laughs) so it's kind of like it's not exactly the same but also like he did like use tension and and like suspense really well with having that the tanker trunk the way he used the tanker truck like popping up all through the movie um so yeah it duel is definitely worth um worth a i didn't know that that it's worth a shot. And also like the, so uh, um, there's a sound, I won't spoil it for, for you or, or our listeners, but there's a sound used toward the end of, um, and maybe, maybe using context clues, you can, you can figure out what the spoil is, but um, there's a sound used at the end of duel that he uses as the shark is sinking. um when they finally kill the shark at the end of uh, Jaws. And it's like this dinosaur roar, almost Godzilla-esque kind of sound um, that kind of happens as the shark is sinking. You kind of hear this like, uh, and uh, he used it. It's, it's kind of like an homage to duel um, kind of his like, thanks to duel for like kind of kicking off his, you know, feature filmmaking career. Um, cause he used that at the end of duel as well. So, um, which I thought was like, like a cool little, um, I guess like a little thing for himself, yeah. a, a little sound for himself in the movie. Um, but it, it, it's, I think he said it's like this dinosaur sound from old, like dinosaur special or something that he, <laughs> that he took. Um, but it does kind of sound like Godzilla. Um, if you listen to it, but, but yeah, that's a a fun fact about that. Yeah. But yeah, that really is interesting. Like 
thought experiment of like, what would this have been if the shark would have worked? Would it have been as good of a movie um, or maybe like a good movie, but not as great as it is? Um, but you have to imagine Spielberg. I mean, even at that point of his, in his career, just like had such an eye for how to use the camera that it still would have turned out, you know, just as good. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it would have been. And I think he doesn't know. Uh, like if you watch interviews with him, he, he kind of is like, I don't know what would have happened if the shark would have worked. Um, but I feel like that's part of why the movie holds up so well. Like, because really mm -hmm. until the end, when you, like, when the shark jumps onto the boat, I mean, by then you're immersed enough that you, like, you yeah. go with it. But like, until then, you know, it's, I mean, it looks like an old film, but it's not, it's not like mm -hmm. jarringly, because you just don't, like, when the shark's under the water, it looks like a shark. Like it's just sort of moving around. Right. But it's really just the very end of the movie where it's like, okay, that's, you know, if that was made today, the shark would look a little a little different but yeah. because it's so hidden like the movie i mean it holds up like it still keeps a lot of right. the, the scares and at least to me i'm not i mean maybe it's just because i saw the film when i was like younger and i was already kind of scared of it but, but like the scares still work even oh yeah you know, however many years later because they mm -hmm. sort of hide the the elements that would date the film yeah yeah and it like you said, like by the time you get to the end where the shark like is very visible, you're just like, you're so into it. It's like you kind of just ignore that or you're not even like noticing how like fake the shark is. Cause if you really like are thinking about it and you are like, if you were to just like go watch a YouTube clip of that, like, and be thinking about like the mechanical shark aspect, you'd be like, Oh yeah, it's very fake looking <laughs> a mechanical shark. Um, but it's but, also just such like a it's such a gruesome yeah like, remain on the boat that that you're also like it's it's horrifying beyond the shark needing to be scary because you're right you know, the being boat sinking and, up and the boat sinking there's blood coming yeah. out of his mouth and so it yeah it sort of substitutes the, the scare factor because there's other things going on that you don't notice as much the fact that I like, guess a big rubber shark yeah. kind of flailing around and jumping out of the water and oh yeah. And Quint, like, Shaw, like, really sells it like, for that for that part. Like, he, uh, I watched, like, the, if you watch it, like, in the making of documentary, they, like, show him doing that scene. And it's kind of, like, it's strange to watch it, like, not in the movie. Because uh, he's just, like, squirming around and screaming at the top of his lungs and, like, spitting out, like, the fake blood. <laughs> and, um... And I want to, if my memory serves me correct, like when he spit out the, like the fake blood, um, after a second, you can like kind of hear some, I guess, crew members like laughing, <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess like laughing at the blood, like the, blah, blah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it, he, he sells it. It's terrifying to watch, to watch the shark, like chew him up basically. Um, in that scene, uh, yeah, I guess like kind of moving through the rest of, uh, production, um, the other like cool stunt thing I thought was, um, the, the, the first kill of the, with the Chrissy, um, and they had like these cables hooked up to her, um, under the like so for the very last part where she's like getting like pulled around by the shark um they had like cables hooked up to her and she was she seemed like she was a really like smart stunt woman because she had all these like she was talking about all these like precautions they took and um she wanted real people to be pulling her not like cranes because um then she felt like she was more in control because she's in the water. She had these like special clips that she could like pull off anytime she needed. Um, just like all these precautions. I was like, Oh, I would have never thought about any of that stuff. Um, and so, but yeah, they had like basically these long cables going to shore and they had like markers where like 
the people pulling the cables would like run from this marker to this marker and then like back to this marker, like basically like pulling her around um, the the way they had it mapped out. So I, I thought that was like a really cool kind of like how they made it kind of section, uh, kind of, I guess, trivia. Um, but yeah, it, it, uh, it works really well that scene, I think. Um, it, well, it's just such an iconic opening. Huh? It's just such yeah. a, I feel like it's just an effective one. It gets, it like immediate, it gets so jarring and I, and I feel like it goes, it's like long enough to be unsettling, but mm-hmm. it doesn't just go on and on to the point that it's just, you know, like almost off putting, I guess, I guess horrific. And then it's, you get like the calm, you know, beach oh, yeah. scene. And then you're just kind of for the rest of the movie, you're just kind of on edge a bit from, Oh yeah. From just sort of that, which I've seen some quotes about yeah. like that was totally his Spielberg, you know, his, I forget what the quote mm-hmm. was, but just sort of like, you know, he went, he told her like, he wants this to be this thing that's going to, you know, unsettle audiences for the rest of this film. Oh yeah. I can. So, uh, I, th- I think I had told you this before we started recording, but um, my parents, I was asking my parents because I know they saw it in theaters. Um, and my dad was 11 when this came out and my mom was nine and they both saw this movie in theaters. Um, and I can just only imagine being like nine years old or um, even like 11 years old uh, and see- <laughs> seeing coming going into this movie and this that being like the first thing you see is like this this girl getting like you know you're not i guess you're not technically seeing her get ripped to pieces but you're imagining it um her getting ripped to pieces <laughs> under the water by the shark um yeah i think my mom too said she was chewing gum and uh she like screamed at one point and like got gum her gum all in her hair <laughs> and had to like cut the gum out of her hair after when they got home um but yeah i just can't imagine being like nine years old and going to see jaws in theaters but it was rated pg <laughs> which is just, yeah it's crazy they um spielberg said that that it was gonna be rated r um but there was this one section that the board was like hey i think it's when the guy uh his leg like falls to the bottom of the ocean floor and it like shows his severed leg, like falling down. Um, there was like, that's, it used to like linger on that longer and like watch it kind of bounce around at the bottom of the ocean floor. I I don't know how much longer, but, um, Steven said like, all he did was like cut some of that out and they moved it from R to PG, (laughs) (laughs) which is just like, all right. (laughs) um and it yeah it led to my my parents being like terrorized in theaters as kids so um (laughs) i guess it i guess it it was good for for business to to knock it down to pg uh but yeah they didn't have the pg-13 back then so it was like jump from straight from pg to r um and yeah, when you when you go back and watch a lot of PG movies from back then, you're like, this would definitely be PG thirteen today, <laughs> or R even some of them. Um, but yeah, one of the cool things with the camera was the um, the cinematographer Bill Butler um, built this like uh, box, this like glass box for the camera because Spielberg wanted um, a lot of shots like at water view. So you kind of have like water lapping up and he wanted it to be like kind of a very human view because he said that a lot of a lot of times, like when you see the ocean in movies, it's like this like really big wide shot and like or it's like he he was basically like you don't get the point of view of like a human like when you're in the water very often in movies. And so, yeah, they built this little box and I think he said it's like 25 percent of the movie about is shot in that little glass box that they built. Um, which when you think about it, there is a lot of like those shots where the water is kind of like passing in front of the camera. And, um, you know, you think of like the chaos of like the 4th of July stampede out of the water. (laughs) Um, and yeah, it's, it's, 
I thought that was a really smart choice for sure. Um, well, it's been effective I, too because, like, especially yeah. for that scene you mentioned, like, because, like, even just the water sort of like hitting the camera, like, does transport you. Like, you're in the water with all these yeah. people. Yeah. Sort mm-hmm. of that point of view, like, there is some almost like more tactile of like it interacting with the that like it's like as you know as all these people are freaking out like you're yeah. in the water you're one of this crowd you know that needs to to get out oh yeah yeah it's kind of um it's kind of one of those things it's like do not watch if you're like claustrophobic or <laughs> or whatever you know whatever the phobia is of the ocean like do not watch um especially these scenes where it feels like you're in the water <laughs> Um, but yeah, overall, you know, as we can all guess, filming at sea was a nightmare for them. Um, all these things like that you wouldn't think about. So just like the way that like the tide will like shift boats around, because a lot of times they're like on one boat or the barge that they had, like all the equipment in and you're shooting like the orca. Well, if you have to wait for something to line up by the time something gets just right, the boats have like shifted in the tide. And so now you have to wait like to shift the boats back into alignment. Um, They talked about how there would be these sailboats on the horizon and they would have to wait for the sailboat to like cross out of like the shot that they're doing. And it could be like an hour and a half or something. Uh, And Spielberg said they would like do calculations and be like, okay, if we flip everything around, get the barge on this side of the boat, flip the boat around. So we get the other horizon for this shot. Well, then it's like an hour and an hour and a half too. So we might as well just sit here and wait for the sailboat to pass (laughs) our horizon shot. So um, just all kinds of stuff um, that just like was a nightmare um, for shooting. they obviously couldn't use tripods because it would have been like, it would have given everyone watching seasickness in the theater. Um, so they had to like do like shoulder held handheld uh, for the cameras so that they could kind of like, I don't know, you know, stabilize with, I guess like bending their knees, I, I would assume um, they didn't have like, they didn't have the like specialized rigs that some people were able to use today to like get smooth shots on the water. Um, Cause even now, like I, you hear like filming ocean stuff is still mm -hmm. a nightmare. I get still, you know, directors and stuff like this. It's not worth the hassle. So like 50 years ago Mm -hmm. doing that, like without without all the equipment and things like, yeah, man, like that just technically that's a challenge. I want to say that um, it was the first like feature film shot on the, like on the ocean. I think I read that somewhere. Um, You know, maybe some, maybe a listener will fact check me and be like, no, you're wrong. And you can just email me and tell me that's, that's the case, you know, establishing shot pod at gmail.com. You can tell me things that I've gotten wrong. Um, But, uh, but yeah, I want to say it's the, like was the first like feature film that had like actual like shot in the ocean stuff. Um, but yeah, even like, um, like I did, I did an episode on Dunkirk for the Christopher Nolan series and they like, they built these like new specialized, like kind of crane rig things that like basically keep the camera like smooth. So, um, you can have like a boat running alongside the boat that you're shooting, but the picture like looks like smooth, um, really like cool technology, but they like developed that for that movie. Um, so (laughs) like, it wasn't out there for them to like, Oh, let's use this. They were like, Oh, we want to, we, we're going to have to like make this. And that was in what? 2016, uh, something like that, uh, that they made that movie. So, yeah, you know, even like up until recently, you don't have technology to like shoot smoothly on the water. But yeah, all kinds of stuff went wrong out there. At one point, like the orca like was sinking. <laughs> they had like um, they were doing something with the barrels and like part of the boat got ripped off or something. 
and it just started sinking. They were trying to like get the orca uh, to shore. Um, just like all kinds of stuff was just went wrong out there. And um, uh, one one of the things I thought was funny was at one point later on in production, um, they were just also exhausted and like just full of like anxiety and whatever that. Um, Roy Scheider at a dinner one night just started, uh, decided he was going to start a food fight, to, like <laughs> loosen everyone up. And they had this like big food fight and Spielberg was like, Oh, and one of the crew like jumped into the pool that was like full of like floating food from the food fight. And I was like, what the heck? And I jumped into, and, <laughs> and I was like, Oh, you've got to imagine like they needed stuff like that to happen yeah. every once in a while to like ease the tension. Um, but yeah, they um, Spielberg actually wasn't there for the final shot of the movie, so they had like the big explosion of the shark um, was kind of like the last thing they shot, and Spielberg left. He went ahead and like left um, early before they they did that, uh, partly because he was just like exhausted and like really like dealing with anxiety and stuff but also because he heard that his crew that half hated him because of, because they went a hundred days over <laughs> schedule out on the ocean. Um, we're planning on like pranking him and like throwing him off the ship and stuff. And so he was like, I don't want to have any part of that. So I'm, I'm out of here. Um, but, uh, but he had like a full blown, like he talks about having like a full blown panic attack when he got to his hotel room in Boston um, which is just like kind of sad to hear. Um, but I, I want to say he, he said he went like down to the bar and Dreyfus was happened to be down there and like, kind of like talked him down a little bit. And, but he said he like had like bad anxiety for like months after finishing this film. Um, which is like, like, I guess it kind of sucks to hear that. Um, but um but you know it's just, it was just it was a hard it was a hard like time he's a young guy like well, he doesn't have pressure like, too like you yeah know, all these like everything going wrong is like mm -hmm. fun now you know and right. it's like oh i can't believe this thing but like to be that young like he's probably one of the youngest people on sets like for yeah you know you know and he's inexperienced and just yeah, just the pressure building up, and you can't really just stop. Like you gotta mm -hmm. keep moving, pressing forward. Then I'm sure just by the yeah. end, like you'd just be just worn down from. Yeah, yeah. The producers even talked about in the in the documentary. They were saying like there were times where Stephen was like wanting to maybe quit or like take a break, and we we didn't let him because they had the experience to know like if you stop then chances are like you're not gonna, they're not going to let you finish the movie if you stop um you just have to keep shooting so so they did they they kept shooting but um one of the last things that happened was um obviously they had to reshoot the you know the stuff with Hooper being alive at the end but also um Spielberg like really wanted to add another scare shot. He, he, I think they had done some screenings even. Um, and the big scare was like when the shark first pops out, when, uh, Scheider's like doing the chumming. Um, and I, I think Spielberg in the interview was talking about, he, he had planned it out so well for that to be a good scare because there's a laugh moment right before, um, the shark pops out. So you let your guard down. Like he, he said at that time, um, the S word like wasn't used a whole lot in film. And so whenever you would use it, it would get like this rebellious laugh from young people and this kind of nervous laughter from, from the older crowd. And so he's like, uh, you come down here and chum this, you know, and, uh, he's doing it. And so he said that got a laugh at the screening, like a really good laugh. And then the shark pops up like right after that because people's guard were let down. It was like screams and everything. Um, and it got him like itching for another scare. 
and uh, he went, went he went back and wanted to do the the corpse like the Ben Gardner corpse popping out of the hole, uh, and they were like, no. <laughs> no, we're not letting you shoot anymore. Like you were a hundred days over schedule and over budget, you know, you're not shooting anymore. And so he actually like took like, I want to say $3,000 of his own money and went and uh, got some shots for that scene and kind of tested it on with his editors and like the editing crew to see which shot worked best. And, um, and yeah, that it made it in the movie. Um, and I'm sure he very quickly made this three thousand dollars back. Um, <laughs> but uh, but but he one of the other things that goes with that is he said he learned something from that because that happens pretty early in the movie um, relative to like all the shark stuff later on. Um, you know the the head pops out and he said it got a lot of good screams. He said, but he noticed that for the the like the chum scare that happens later on it didn't get as many screams in like later screenings once that other scene uh, Hmm. was added in and he said he learned that once you scare the audience then they're like on guard so um so he just kind of learned like to be strategic about like when and how like he scares the audience so that like they're not like too on guard for like scares later in the movie or whatever. I I thought that was a really cool, like insight that he, you know, I guess like as a filmmaker, you're always trying to like learn from like what you do and paying attention to like what works and what doesn't work. Um, Well, there's a, I don't know if you've heard of, um, I guess for the the people watching the, the video version, if you've ever heard of this, it's a new book. You are what you watch. Mm-hmm. Um, it just came out, but it's like a data scientist, and he just sort of talks about how movies impact you. and And one of the things he discusses in it is he talks about Jaws, and I forget all the details of the experiment, but he like hooked himself up with things that's like measuring his skin and like you know like how he reacts to to you know to scares and things, and then watched Jaws. And then in the book, he has like a little graph, but it's like it's the when things kind of spike and then go down and they're like almost perfectly spaced all throughout draws like the the the, where he 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 gets you up on a high and then gives you just enough time to kind of come down and like let your guard down and then he hits you with something else and then he like there's not a whole bunch you know one after another and it's like i don't know if he how intentional he was with that but but it is does seem like he has a good sense of like the flow of you know, you get scared and then you sort of settle in and there's some character stuff and some humor and then he hits you again and mm-hmm. where, you, where you're, you're not like on edge enough that you're just waiting for it, but, but there's always something coming. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And there are a lot of laughs in this movie. Um, oh, yeah, it's hilarious. Like it's, yeah, it's like underrated for just like humor, like the, yeah, like Hooper, like, you know, when Quentin squeezes like the beer and then who squeezes like his styrofoam cup or like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and even just some of the delivery of like uh, Brody, like, are you rich? Like, yeah, you know, I'm rich. Like this, the way yeah. they say things that like, like, there's, there's a lot of funny moments. Like it's, it's really not like a, like it's horrific. It's like a horror movie thriller, mm-hmm. but like it has a lot of like adventure vibes and fun and like, it's not just, a scary movie like there's some there's some funny stuff in this yeah yeah for sure um it and I, that does for sure help with like letting your guard down again to be scared again <laughs> um yeah it, I, I i would have to imagine like he was he was pretty like strategic with that um just because it it seems like he's pretty like He can, especially like reading about how he made Duel and the way he like meticulously like planned out all of the shooting and stuff. Like I would have to imagine he, this is probably the most like out of sequence shot movie and like kind of ad libbed movie he made. Um, But I'm sure there was still a lot because you have to edit it together. Um, And I know he was like very involved with, um, Verna Fields, the editor, and like putting everything together. 
So I would have to imagine like he was pretty strategic um, about all that stuff. Hello again. Do you know how you can really support the show for free in just a few minutes or less? That's right. Just leave a rating and review on Spotify and Apple or wherever you listen that might allow for ratings and reviews. These really help the visibility of the podcast. In fact, just hit that pause button right now and drop the review right now. And then you can get back to the show. I'd greatly appreciate it. Okay, I trust that you went and left that rating and review now. Back to the show. Yeah, it, it of course, went, you know, way over budget, way over schedule. Um, and uh, I, I want to say I heard somewhere, too, that it was originally supposed to be released, like, December of 74. Um, and obviously that was going to be hard to do because of how over schedule it was uh, with production. And so um, it, I guess that's an, maybe that's another happy accident, like that it started, it basically like began the summer blockbuster because it went over, over schedule and they had to release it in the summer of 75 instead of December of 74. Um, but yeah, it was really um, too kind of unprecedented the way they released it. Um, so they used, used to always release movies like slowly, like, into a few theaters, then more and more like each, each subsequent weekend. Um, but they released this one into over 400 theaters, like immediately, um, the, the very first weekend. And they did like this big TV ad campaign for three days leading up to it, um, where they spent like, it was thousands then, but I, I want to say it was like the equivalent of like $3 million today um, in TV ads, like leading up to the release. Um, and yeah, it just, it came out and it just blew up. Um, everyone went to go see it. I think, I think in 1975, like 67 million people saw Jaws in theaters um, and it made, um, it was the first film to ever top a hundred million dollars in the block box office. It passed up. Um, I think the Godfather was the top at the time when it came out. Um, and, uh, there was like this marketing ad campaign. Like you can look up pictures of it, um, where like it was keeping track of all the movies it was passing in the box <laughs> office. And it was like a shark, like eating, <laughs> eating the next movie and how much it made like is like, and so, you know, the last one was like the Godfather 80 something million and the sharks like eating it um, when it finally passed it. And uh, yeah, it, it's just wild to think about. I think it, I think it ended the year with like $260 million maybe domestically. Um, but it eventually worldwide made almost $500 million. Um and I think it stayed like at the top for a while. Um, I want to say, I'm not sure if star Wars pa might've passed it when star, star Wars came Wars, out. Yeah, yeah. I know there's like a, there's like a picture or a card or something that they, I think yeah. Spielberg sent Lucas or whatever. And it's like, uh, -huh. C3PO fishing out jaw or something like that to, yeah. To like commemorate that they passed the, um, is there any, I don't know, I haven't seen, like, obviously, while they were making it, it was up in the air, but I, before it came out, were they confident, like, was there, did they have a sense that, like, now no. that I'm going to edit it, like, this is, we got a good thing here, or was it, like, no, let's help people? <laughs> yeah, if you watch, if you watch, like, the making of, um, uh, so, do you have it on, do you happen to have, like, a physical copy of it? Yeah. So um, I don't know if it has it on yours, but on my the Blu-ray that I got, um, it has the whole like two hour making of making oh, wow. of Jaws yeah. documentary. Um, and so if you watch that, you know, obviously towards the end of the documentary, you know, they're talking about the release and um, the, the producers and like Dreyfus and like several others talk about how like, 
they went to like a premiere or whatever and they were just like so su- so surprised like how like Dreyfus says like it got like a standing ovation when it ended and then like people sat back down and watched all the credits and then like <laughs> applause again like when the credits ended and um they like I think it Dreyfus says he like saw I don't remember if it was Scheider or somebody like when they went out of the theater and they were just like, like we did it. Like, wow. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, I don't think they, I think they were like probably proud of, you know, what they made, but I don't think they had any sense of like, I don't think anyone could have had any sense of a movie being this big. Yeah. Um, Just a phenomenon like the, yeah. I mean, to like, not only be like a i mean it 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 is like the first summer blockbuster there's there's not really any i don't think there's any like contention on what was the first summer blockbuster like it was jaws um and uh yeah i don't think i mean there was no precedent for that so yeah i i would have to say they were probably just all like blown away um, and, uh, you know, Spielberg included, um, which Spielberg seems like he's you, like when you watch him in interviews, he's, he's got this like really like well-balanced mix of like humility and confidence. Like he knows he's good at what he does and he talks like confidently about what he does, but he also like does it in a pretty like, like well-managed humble way uh too um so i don't know maybe spielberg had a sense of like this is really good um but again like even him like there's no way he would have like imagined this you know um but yeah it uh it did have um it had like the you know it had the cultural aspect too of like people were scared to go in the ocean after watching jaws um and i I think at one point in the documentary gottlieb says uh that like when they were like writing it and making it he was like oh i think this might do the same thing for the ocean that psycho did for showers um (laughs) which is which was a funny line to me but um but yeah i mean it did like even more so like people were like not going in swimming in the ocean anymore. Um, and it feels like by the time, like my parents who saw it as kids, like were taking me as a kid to the ocean. It was like, basically like a no, no to go out like too far into the ocean. <laughs> um, I don't know if you had like that experience as a, as a kid or whatever, but yeah. I don't, think, I don't know if we have that, but it, even like, like shark week, like even like 50 yeah. years later, it's like they're still trying to like combat these like narratives and fears. Like, I mean, sharks <laughs> yeah. are scary, but I, right. you know, this sort of man is, you know, this almost like a serial killer in the water. Like, yeah. It's like they're trying to like combat this. Like, it's like 50 years later. Yeah. It's just, like it's so took root of just sort of this fear of these creatures in the ocean. Oh, yeah, for sure. It, um, it went on to win uh three oscars it won for sound uh for editing and for of course the music for the score original score by john williams um it did not win best picture it was nominated um spielberg was a little upset that he didn't get the director nomination um i've read that he was kind of like uh i don't he had like some harsh feelings about not getting the nominated for director for this movie um which i mean i guess like to be honest like it's probably he he has the right to be because it's so well directed (laughs) because what Um, did win do you know uh, i don't remember what who won director but i do know one flew over the uh, cuckoo's nest one best picture um which i haven't seen i haven't Um, seen either so so i I don't better (laughs) <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's it's hard to imagine anything being better than jaws that year um i'm sure there were there were other like worthy uh movies and from from what i hear one flew over the 
Cuckoo's yeah. Nest is a really good movie. Um, but yeah, I haven't seen it, so cannot confirm or deny. Um, another another fun fact was uh, Jaws was the first uh, you know pr- printed laser disc. So when hmm. laser disc came out, Jaws was like the first one they like produced to like market and release, uh, which makes sense because like people kept going to see it in theaters. So they probably are going to buy it, want to buy the laser disc to keep watching it over and over at home. Um, and then the other, the other like fun fact about its release that I put down was that in 1979, it aired on ABC for the first time and it garnered 57% of the TV audience, <laughs> which is, which is crazy. <laughs> Um, like no, nothing does that. Uh, obviously like you can't really get stats like that today because people, you know, it's a TV audience like cable or satellite is not really a thing anymore. Um, so there, you know, there, you can't really get a modern day equivalent, um, of that or it would be hard to, but yeah, 57% is crazy. Uh, I feel like, um, I don't know what normal numbers were like, but I would have to imagine they're, it's no. very far from that many. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think the big thing um, is, so like, obviously there were a lot of, um, a lot of like critics that like praised the movie and Spielberg had kind of like gained the favor of critics just with like his directorial choices and camera work. Like critics had, all, all the way back to Duel had kind of appreciated him, even if they didn't like necessarily like Duel or um, he had a couple other TV movies um, or Sugarland Express, which was his first theatrical release. They appreciated like his directing choices. Um, so yeah, he, you know, he got a lot of praise, but there were also like a lot of critics that were kind of like very wary of this movie. Um, and it does have to do with it kind of being the father of summer blockbusters. Um, so like, I think the, you know, at this time in like the late sixties and early seventies, there were all these, like, it was kind of like the new way, like the new wave of Hollywood. It was like all these like important, um, like meaningful movies that were coming out. Um, you know, it, I think the penultimate one you can think of is like the Godfather. It's like this very artistic and like movie that's packed with like meaning and gravitas and drama. Um, And there was, it was like a, there was like a wave of a movement of these movies and critics were like really excited because these are the kinds of movies that the critics love, but also like the general public is starting to like, get into these movies too. Um, And so here comes Jaws, which is like just this like suspense filled, like, (laughs) um, like shark action movie. Um, And a lot of these critics, uh, you know, I I don't know like what the proportion would have been. It's hard to gain a sense of that, like not being there at the time. Um, But like from some of the reading I've done, there were a decent amount of critics that were like, kind of like upset with jaws because it was like they felt like it was a regression from the advancement of like the late sixties and early seventies of the types of movies we were getting. Um, Which is almost like the equivalent of, I mean, different situation, but I, the way that I, the MCU now or something like that, Mm -hmm. or this idea that I, this is sort of the popular masses thing. And, yeah, it's, it's still in a way it's sort of steering things in a direction away from like cinema. Yeah. Cinema with a capital C. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, yeah. And, and that was the question, like, was this mo- at the time, like, was this good or bad for movies? Um, like, I, I guess like, yeah, I guess f- you could say for cinema with a co- capital C, <laughs> was this good or bad for it? Um And and I mean, if you think about it, like it's the first summer blockbuster, the next, the very next year you have Rocky, 
um, another huge summer blockbuster. The very next year after that, you have Star Wars. Um, and the, like that succession of like movies, like really kicks off this like summer blockbuster thing that it, like you said, eventually turns into this big, like franchise, um, build like movie building industry basically. Um, and you know, I, I think in hindsight, it is an interesting question to ask, like, was the big summer blockbuster, like, was it good or bad for movies? I kind of, I, I kind of feel like in the middle of the fence, like, I think it was both, you know, um, because you do have the kind of franchise results that we're all kind of, we all kind of seem to be tired of at this point. Like, can we make something like new and fresh and original instead of like rehashing another like superhero universe? Um, and, and I really do think even like the biggest like MCU fans are starting to feel a little bit like that. That's kind of the, that's kind of like what it feels like in the conversation, you know, when you talk to people about it. But um, I don't know. Do you, do you have any thoughts on like what this did for movies? Like, was it good? Was it bad? A little bit of both. Yeah. Cause in some ways you feel like it's, it was almost inevitable. Like, Sort mm-hmm. of the like the summer blockbuster was gonna be a thing, and at some point it was gonna sort of yeah maybe so yeah. more corporate or but, but yeah because it's sort of like it's it did start that, but it gets also such a quality yeah yeah I feel like the, it's something the different a lot of like kind of like the issue with a lot of like more recent of these sort of the ones that make us tired of summer blockbusters. Is they just don't have the same level of like quality, like the you know, right. like you were saying, like this the way the shots are composed or the the acting, like all this mm-hmm. stuff. It's it, it does feel a bit more like I like guess is you know you like a McDonald's esque of yeah. Not that the people involved aren't talented, and you know, obviously tons of effort goes into these movies, but it's just there's so much of it, and it's happening so quick, mm-hmm. and there's that it, and there's just more movies that. I don't know. Maybe it's just like this overkill. But yeah, it is kind of crazy to think of. Like, I mean, that's all I've ever known is the big summer movies. Mm-hmm. It's it's kind of weird to think that that wasn't always the case. That you just got all these big right. massive spectacles. Yeah, every year almost. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. It's even at the time, like it, it, critics were kind of split. Um, Again, I don't know in what proportion. Was it like 50-50 or 70-30? I don't really know. Um, but like there were also people that were like felt like Spielberg and Lucas were like reinvigorating Hollywood um, at a time where maybe it was like slowing down. So, uh, you know, it's just one of those things where it's like I'm happy we have Jaws, um, you know, I think that there's just like anything. So Jaws obviously like is just a really well-made movie. It's not what we think about when we think of like tired summer blockbusters, like, like you were talking about. Um, And I I just think it's like one of those things where like, there's going to be good and bad that comes of it. It's in that, like you said, kind of inevitable. Um, we're going to get some good stuff and we're going to get some like kind of junk (laughs) along the way. And you just kind of got to like weed through it, you know? Um, But like thinking of last year, like, cause I was, I kind of feel similar to like what you were talking about with MCU movies of just like, I'm kind of like tired of the same old, like, story like they're kind of the same stories over and over just with different characters and all that but this if you think about this past summer like we got barbenheimer uh which was a huge phenomenon like the hugest phenomenon uh to date i would think um of summer blockbusters and you know two being released on the same day in barbie and oppenheimer and like really like both of those movies are like really well-made original 
movies that like did really well and like super well made, you know? Um, and so I don't know, like that kind of like gives you hope for like, Oh, are we going to get like more, are we going to get a run of like jaws, Rocky star Wars again? Um, maybe, I don't know, but one yeah, can just the hunger one can for, dream, right? <laughs> Cause even like, I know like, uh, Nolan and stuff, like, you know, there's, they want that, but, yeah, there's sort of this hunger for like almost proving like Jaws did. Like that, there people have a hunger for some of these original yeah. type, and which people have been saying for a while. But like Barbenheimer showed that, like at least mm-hmm. for good ones, people will actually flock to the theater and go see it right. too. Which you sort of hope leads to it being a bit more viable of like you know take the chance. But it will make money, right? But, yeah it yeah there's also just like the machine now is just like how can we replicate barbenheimer how can we yeah and it's just like no like just make good movies (laughs) (laughs) and people will like be excited you know obviously you have to market it like barbie and oppenheimer were both marketed really well obviously um i mean there's no denying that but but jaws was marketed really well they did this they invested a ton of money into marketing it. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Um, maybe just like try not to just be, you know, the success of like good movies isn't dependent on like zeros and ones and data. Like it's, it's dependent on like, is it well-made art and do people like connect with it and, you can market that once it's made, but you've got to like, you've got to actually like make yeah. those movies first. <laughs> but yeah, we, we did kind of talk about like how well this holds up. Um, and, and just like one of the things that I think about with that is the filmmaking still feels so fresh. Um, like the way Spielberg moves the camera and like sets up like, composes like shots and like where people are in them it just like feel still feels so like fresh and energetic um compared to like just compared to like some old movies like you watch it and you're you can just the way it's shot you're like oh you know this is shot really well but you can tell like it's an old movie um in the way it's shot and this like feels still like it feels like someone if they made it today would have shot it in similar ways, you know, it doesn't feel like antiquated as far as like the way he moves the camera and all that. Well, and Um, I feel like too, it's such a perfect balance of like, he's doing so many interesting stuff with the camera and like, you know, this cool shots like going through the, the like mouth and like kind of following the, the boat as it's leaving. But I, but it never becomes distracting. Like it's right. Like there's enough to always keep it interesting. It's always moving, mm-hmm. but unless you're just trying to like take note of it, you don't necessarily think about the fact that he's doing a lot of cool stuff with the camera. Like it's, yeah. you're always invested in the story, but when you sort of step back, you're like, you know, he's not just setting the camera out there and having character, you know, say action. Like he's, it's always doing, you know, Mm-hmm. Or like even just the the famous with like the Brody on the beach and just the way I don't know how they I forget how they accomplish that effect where like the camera sort of like pulls out but kind of goes close like when he first yeah is like having that you know fear on the beach or whatever mm-hmm. like just cool things like that that just you know. yeah yeah well let's talk about that sequence because I think that's a good example to talk about um, because I, one could argue like that's the best like sequence in the whole movie. Um, the way like he builds the tension and like, he has like, he has this like really smart idea to make it feel like one long shot. And the way he like gets that effect is he has like people pass right in front of the camera so that you're not like making the typical, you know, jump cuts from one view to the next, but like you, it feels, it feels smoother because you have that kind of swipe of someone walking in front of the camera. And when they pass by, it's like closer or you're switching from seeing Brody's face to like his point of view looking out. Um, and that's such good, like tension building, like getting closer and closer, like building the tension. Um, 
and then yeah, the, like the really cool, um, which I, I want to say originated with uh rear window, um, uh, Hitchcock's rear window, that shot where basically what they're doing is they're moving the camera away, but all, and zooming in at the same time. And so it okay. creates, yeah, so it's on a dolly and you're, you move the camera back and, and zoom in like on their face at the same time. So it creates that like stretching almost effect, um, that you get. And, uh, and it's, yeah, I'm pretty, I don't know if it's the first time it was used necessarily, but it's definitely the most like famous, like first time people noticed. Um, and it really became a thing was in Hitchcock's rear window. Um, it's like at the very beginning when, um, Jane, uh, Jimmy Stewart is like looking down, he's like hanging from a building and he like looks down into the alleyway and it does that like in the alleyway to like show his like fear of heights. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it, it works really well here, like on Brody's face to like show the, um, and it is, it's like, it's a flashy, it's like a flashy artistic move, but it like, it's just like so well timed and placed and he's like very patient leading up to it. Uh, yeah, it's so good. That whole yeah, that, sequence that whole is so sequence, good. Even just the way they, like the way he incorporates, like, you know, everyone arriving and just like the busyness and there's like yeah. cheerful kind of music and like, but there's this sense of like dread because as the audience, you know, mm -hmm. danger awaits, but just the way he, kind of plays with your emotions with like the music or even because like in the water, there's several shots like, you know, under the water, which he previously oh, yeah. used for the shark. So every time you go down there, you're like, is it, you know, are we the shark again? And I like, guess not, mm -hmm. I like, get sort of a fake out and just sort of, <laughs> you just sort of, you just sort of keep waiting and he, he kind of keeps getting you to the edge and then he, you know, yeah. backs off or whatever. But And I think he starts you off off guard because doesn't it start off with like the, shark attack video game <laughs> oh yeah which is, shooting the yeah which apparently was a real game um i mean it would have had to been they they wouldn't have made that for yeah. the movie um but yeah it, that made me like chuckle so it like it kind of starts you off like with a little bit of like ease <laughs> um and then just like builds and builds and then even like after after that like you have like it, i'm this may be a different point in the movie, but I'm pretty sure there's like the tracking shot where it's like following him over to the estuary, uh, where his son is. Um, I think that's the same. Isn't, isn't that the 4th of July or is that yeah. another time? Yeah. 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 Cause so they pull like, everyone out of the water and you're like, okay, nothing yeah. happened. And then they just move and it. They over follow it. And there's yeah. that like tracking shot. So like, you're still like, there's like tension building, tension building. And then like, a short relief, but then like he immediately starts building tension, like tracking him over, like following Brody as he's going. And like, he's like, Oh, what's happening now? Kind of rolling his eyes. And then his wife's like, our kid is in there. And like, so like, it, it's like building tension again. Um, just so good. And it's just so the visual, like when he's calling everyone out of the water, he's yeah. like almost dancing right on the edge. You know, he won't even put his feet in, like you know, mm -hmm. sort of like, which then you contrast like to the end where he's like fully submerging himself, like to, and it's just sort of these, you know, like I mean, it's obviously not super subtle, but and they talk right before that about how he doesn't go in the water, but right, but it's just a cool visual of like he's the the police and he's in charge of saving people, but like he's he's not even getting his like feet wet, like he's just sort of running yeah. around and like, calling them in, and right, like, yeah. And uh, that too, that scene too is very like it's character building in that, in that way. But it, it's also like, it also does a lot of, a lot, I think thematically with um, the mayor and the way people react. Um, you know, the mayor basically like forces that one, like as one of his like henchmen, I guess you could say to take his grandkids out into the water. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then face like, just check me up like this, yes. like, dude, like the late, especially the lady, like she just does not want to go out there, but she no. so beautifully does. But yeah, and it's like you know, it's doing stuff thematically in the sense of like, okay, like we're we're not gonna like 
talk about this like and overdo it, but there is like that, okay, at what point is this just like capitalist greed? Like <laughs> we're, we've got to make our money. So let's put people's lives in danger so that we can like make our money uh, sort of thing. Um, there's that at play too. And then the, even the panic kind of plays into that of like everyone, once the panic starts, like nobody is like, well, hardly anybody, you got like the mom holding her kid and stuff, but like there's the one guy that like snatches the rats from some kids <laughs> and like <laughs> yeah. taken off. And like, you're like somebody like, I don't know how they got everyone out safe. Like, I feel like someone would have gotten like stampeded and like drowned in that panic. Um, but yeah, it, it's, there's a lot going on in that, in that sequence for sure. Um, hello there, listener. Don't you ever want more for your life? Don't you ever dream of surpassing the status of just podcast listener? Well, I've got good news. If you head on over to establishingshotpod.com and click the send a voicemail button on the right side of your screen, you can be featured on the podcast. I'd love to hear from you, whether it's a comment in response to an episode you liked, an opinion of mine you disagreed with, or just a question for me. And if you're too shy to have your voice featured, you can always email me at establishingshotpod at gmail.com. Don't settle for just being a podcast listener. Reach for the stars and get featured on The Establishing Shot. Back to the show. I will say like two other like really stand out like scenes for both like character building, but also like composition um, that I always think of are one of the scenes that I love for like Brody and his like family connection is like the, the, his son, like mimicking him at the oh, table. So good. Yeah. I love it. It's just, it's so sweet and it's like so endearing and it, it does. It's, it's very efficient. It says so much with that, like short little thing um, about Brody, about his family um, that like, it just communicates so much in such a small amount of time. Um, and it's just like very sweet. And like, you just love, you, you kind of grow fond of Brody just by watching that scene. Um, yeah. Well, it, it does. Cause it, it like endears him, but then like, it also just reveals so much. Like, you know, like a, a young kid has been killed and he's, you know, he's the chief yeah. and he could have shut down the beach and like the film never really, explains if he's thinking about that but but you know he is you know that it's you know he's mm -hmm. he's sort of depressed about you know because he kind of says you know give me a guess why because i need it like he's struggling right. with that and it mm -hmm. just it sort of makes it more because you don't really know the kid that gets eaten but it makes it more mm -hmm. like a personal like this guy has a kid yeah you know, it he, could have been this kid you know it could have been him like he needs to protect like he needs to mm -hmm. yeah i love that moment this is sort of that quiet moment yeah so good. And then I also love the, the billboard scene too is, is very good. Um, but I, you know, the, the dialogue in it is very good, like, and kind of funny and ridiculous. Like the mayor's like more worried about the vandalism, <laughs> which, um, which one, one of the, I think one of the funniest things about the movie is there's like this recurring thing about a karate class, like, karate chopping the mayor's fence <laughs> <laughs> which is just like i don't, i don't think the kids are the problem i think you need a new fence if kids can karate chop your fence apart <laughs> it's like it's got to be rotted if <laughs> if kids can so easily like chop it off with their hand <laughs> that's because like the secretary or whatever it is yeah she's like the rabbit on about yeah. This is the most like, like you almost don't even pay attention because you're focused on Brody, but when uh -huh. you do, it's like that's like what is she talking about? Yeah, and then there's the old man too at the beach when he's trying to like watch the water. That's like talking to him about the Karate Kids, and <laughs> oh, I don't think I even realized that's the same. And he's yeah. like Brody's sort of trying to like look over his shoulder. And... Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. Um, but yeah, the mayor in that scene, it, there, it's it's a very like funny, but also like 
again, just like playing into to kind of those themes that it's kind of subtly, but not so subtly kind of hitting on. Um, but also just like the way he moves the camera and like moves the characters around is just so, so good. Um, because like they're constantly like shifting positions in camera by the way they like move around each other. And that doesn't like happen by accident. It would look like a mess if they were just like <laughs> walking around improv. Um, that's like all that stuff has to be like planned out, like because, and that's confirmed because like they start moving and like the cam, it's just one long shot. The camera like moves and follows them, and like uh, you get the billboard shot, and they're like down there, and then it like does this like low angle shot where it's like looking up at them. Um, it's just like, he's doing so much and it's like so smooth and like, it looks flawless, but like, if you really like analyze that scene, there's like a ton of movement going on that has to be so like planned out just right. Um, it's just like incredible. It's just like this 27 year old is just like <laughs> an incredible director already. <laughs> but yeah, you, uh, we've got to talk about the Indianapolis speech. Um, I, it's Spielberg said it's his favorite part of the movie. Um, and I think it's probably like most, I think it's, if you ask like 10 people, it was probably like seven of the people would probably say the Indianapolis speech is like the best part of the movie. Um, well, I think it's even like, for me, it's that whole sequence, like even yeah, leading going, up to it and after like, too. Yeah. The whole moment of the three of them, like, I feel like there's so much going on and it it's like, it's so like, it takes you through so many different emotions and tones, but just the way that the, like almost like the billboard scene, the way the characters are positioned and how they change throughout yeah. that sequence and just give me, like, you know, all sort of apart and they eventually they all kind of end up together, mm -hmm. you know, at the table, but, and, and just sort of Brody being the outsider. Like, yeah, yeah. I love the, I feel like the the moment where Quint and and Hooper are like comparing all like comparing their scars and stuff, and mm -hmm. there's sort of that moment where like Brody looks down, and like it looks like it may be a gunshot wound or something. He probably yeah. has this great story, but he doesn't share it. Like he's sort of the outsider, right. and he he's not going to step. And they're sort of sharing these silly stories, and you know, just so much kind of character. They positions all their their characters so well of kind mm -hmm. of who they are, like what they're about, and sort of how they you know, in a sense represents them kind of coming together and, you know, the, the Quentin Hooper kind of finally unite over something. Yeah. But, but then just having like dropping that speech right in the middle of that sequence and, you know, just totally taking the, the air out of the room and yeah. kind of having him deliver that. And like, I mean, it's just so good the way he, it is the way he's like, every word in that is just so well, like articulated and just mm -hmm. delivered. Yeah, he it oh, it's so incredible like the so and I think even um yeah, it was Dreyfus who said cuz one of the things that I think Spielberg does so well is like the whole time he's giving the speech, he keeps Dreyfus like in frame so you can like see his reaction like as he's telling the speech. Um and Dreyfus said like that he was not acting in that. He was like <laughs> just as enthralled as you are with the storytelling uh, through that sequence, um, which I, I would imagine is probably true. Like I would have been sitting there like with my mouth open too, if, if I was the other actor, you know, sitting next to him. Um, but yeah, he, the, the version of that speech that we get, or, you know, I, I talked about it originated with Sackler, um, but then uh, it wasn't, quite long enough Sackler only wrote like a short little thing um and then they got a guy named J John Milius to kind of work on it more and he wrote this like really long version of it that was like way too long uh and then Shaw actually himself actually like pared it down and like changed it to like fit his his acting I guess he he wrote it uh, cause there were some things that were said a certain way that he was like, 
maybe this actor could say it that way, but I can't do it that way. So he kind of made it his own and like pared it down to what it is. So um, even like Robert Shaw had a lot to do with how good that speech was um, just getting it exactly right. Uh, and man, it, it really is. It's, it's just phenomenal. Like, and it, it's the thing too, that I think makes Quint almost as like, just, it may, it gives you empathy for him. If nothing else, you know, you kind of understand who he is and why he is the way he is finally. Um, from that, from that scene. Yeah, even and, right before it, like Hooper's sort of laughing about the, the tattoo and I uh -huh. just the subtle moment of like Quint sort of putting his hand on Hooper's arm and kind of like, you know, sort of gently just sort of stopping him and like mm -hmm. just showing that more serious side to like he, Quint's still sort of smiling, but like, you know, there's, you know, he's tortured from right. what's happened, but yeah, definitely does. And I feel like just as a movie, like that scene mm -hmm. grounds it so much as like a something beyond just the the scary monster chomping down on a bunch of people. Like yeah. that is such a great acted kind of dramatic whole sequence that mm -hmm. it sort of just elevates it beyond just sort of the the more breezy kind of you know gross right. people out type film. Right, and and like the. You really do. So with those three characters, you have these like kind of three different views of masculinity um, that we've kind of we've kind of touched on. But, you know, you know, Hooper, I guess, is kind of the more intellectual kind of masculine figure. Quinn is kind of like the I don't I guess like vulgar jock ish kind of like masculine character and Brody's kind of like, you know, we talked about, he's kind of like the every man, he's the family man, um, you know, in charge, but doesn't feel like he's in charge sort of, uh, kind of guy, uh, more reserved. And, uh, but like in that moment and it's like, what's cool is like, it's a moment of like really deep vulnerability. Um, like there's a, it starts off with like a, a macho contest, right? <laughs> Who has the best scar, but then it turns into this moment of like deep vulnerability. Uh, and like, especially because it's from the character you'd least expect that from, <laughs> um, that like kind of creates this bond. Like, and even though they're, they're also very different from different backgrounds, like they're, they're able to, because Quint was so vulnerable, like find a common ground um, between them. And doesn't it, doesn't it go into like the show me the way to go home uh, after the, oh, yeah, speech? the, yeah, the show me yeah, the way to go that, home. That the speech yeah. with sort of two more humorous sort of fun. Um, mm -hmm. But then, yeah, when it switches to that, like all three of them are now at the table. Like yeah. Brody at some point, I guess mm -hmm. after he comes the and joins them. Down and, just and that's sort of just like, another visual of like, now they're all together. Yeah. Like Brody joins them at the table. They're all sitting there together singing in unison, you know? Um, and one of the cool things kind of behind the scenes was like, you know, the crew kind of, uh, I, th I think I heard about like the crew kind of was feeling like that. <laughs> Um, and the crew was kind of like getting teary eyed, not in a like emotional way, but just like, Oh, we feel like we want to go home too, kind of thing. Um, but yeah, that's, it's just, it's a very good scene. Very powerful. Um, I guess like other, we talked a lot about like the way he composes and blocks, but like he even does it well, like when they're just on the ship, the way they he films them and edits them together. Moving around the ship is just incredible. Um, and you also, another like Spielberg distinctive is you even get some like silhouette shots. He <laughs> loves to do those silhouette shots. You get it with like, you know, the woman in the water at the beginning, you get it with Quint standing, you know, on the pulpit of the boat with the sunset behind him. Um, just like really pretty shots. Like, the one I always think of for Spielberg is like the um, 
Raiders of the Lost Ark one yeah. when they're when they're digging is like the one that comes to mind. But I'm noticing like it's kind of he does it in every movie, I think. The the like character silhouetted against like a sunset or something like that. Um it's just a cool like image, I guess, that he recurringly uses. Which is uh it just reminds me of another one of my favorite scenes in the movie, I think it comes right after one of those sort of silhouette scenes where Brody is trying to convince like Quint and stuff that they should go back, you know, not stay out the whole night. And he like, launches into this argument and then like the scene, it just sort of fades out and then it switches and they're still out there. Like it just, mm-hmm. you know, Spielberg just sort of cuts off his like, you know, is, is this some lame argument? And he's trying to, yeah. you know, we don't need to stay out. We can go back, call for help. And, you just heard his voice just trails off and then all of a sudden you're it's like the next day or whatever. And it's just such a, it's just a, it's a for me, I always crack up at that, but it's also just for Brody's character. Like, mm-hmm. you know, he just, he's really not the one with the in control at that moment. Like he's no not. one's really, the other two guys aren't <laughs> listening to him. Like he, you know, still Brody doesn't even need to show that, give you us his argument. Cause it's just, it's going nowhere, but yeah. Yeah. And, um, the scene, the, also the thing that always gets me is um, when uh, Quint like goes and smashes the radio. <laughs> it's like you already know he's nuts, but when he smashes the radio, it's like solidified. Like this guy is like certifiable. Like he's he's certifiable, like insane. <laughs> and just Brody, like he doesn't know what. Like he just, he's so he's mad like, they can't do anything. He just keeps like you're certifiable. You know, he just. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, yeah. Now that you say that, he he vocalizes what we're all thinking. <laughs> yeah, he's just, but he can't do anything. He's just sort of yelling at him. He just, he, I think yeah. he smashes too. He's just, <laughs> oh man. But yeah, um, I don't know. I think I think we've kind of hit on a lot of thematic stuff along the way. Was were there any other like kind of themes that are in the movie that that you thought uh, we haven't really hit hit much on that should be brought up uh, i don't know i guess this probably isn't a theme but like you were saying with like the three kind of i guess ways of expressing sort of their masculinity like the different characters i just always like that the you sort of see like all three are needed like none of them really mm-hmm. trust each other and really none of them thinks they need each other i guess they maybe think they need quint but you know they don't yeah. know what their role is and there's sort of that moment where quint sort of tells Hooper, like, you know, you don't have, you're not rich boys, don't have enough education to kind of admit when they're wrong. But then Mm -hmm. near the end of the film, when like the boat's half underwater and, you know, the, the, there's three barrels on the shark and it's not working and kind of Quint grabs some of Hooper's like, you know, whatever uh, harpoon or Mm -hmm. gun things and kind of like, Hey, you know, like what can these fancy equipment do anything? And like, he can't admit he was wrong either. But it's right. just sort of this moment where in his own kind of way, you know, all the high tech equipment that he just sort of made fun of the whole time. He's like, you know, we sort of need some of that because what I've been doing, you know, isn't working. And then obviously Brody's the one that you know, blows the thing up. But just right. sort of just that kind of arc of, you know, eventually all sort of their strengths and stuff are utilized in in various ways. But as yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's like, you you know, you kind of wonder like, well, if they all would have like trusted each other and used <laughs> each other's strengths, would they have like, would they have had as much trouble as they did? I mean, probably still, cause it's a crazy gigantic shark. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's, um, that is definitely there. Um, the other thing that like, I had thought of was just how like there are like forces in the world that we, whether they're natural or, you know, you know, for, for you and I, like we believe there's also like supernatural, you know, forces and, you know, take, you know, listener, take that as you do it with that, what you will, but it's undeniable that there's natural like forces out there that um, 
it's hard to call anything but evil. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, we, it, I think this movie plays a little bit with that, just that idea of there's evil out there. And sometimes it's like uncontrollable. Um, and we, we try to like suppress our belief in it or, or at least like try to ignore it and think, try to tell ourselves that it can't get to us. Uh, but, but it's out there like, and it can. And I think that, I think this movie is playing a little bit with that idea too. Just that there, there are these, like, there is evil out there, like, and none of us are like, you know, impervious to it. Um, like we, we shouldn't like ignore it when it shows itself, we should like deal with it. <laughs> uh, or, you know, you could end up on the orca in the middle of the ocean, you know, getting terrorized by a shark that won't go down, <laughs> you know? Um, and even just like the contrast, like I said, of the, of just Brody, like, you know, he's scared of the water and he's, mm-hmm. he's supposed to protect people from the shark, but he can't get his feet wet. The sort of, you know, if, if you make the shark kind of represent some sort of evil or forces or things like just the difference between kind of standing on the shores with dry feet, like calling people in frantically to the end where he's like literally being like submerged into the mm-hmm. water with the shark, you know, for that last shot to sort of the, yeah. you know, him like finding, I guess the strength or courage or whatever it is, desperation uh, to yeah. like confront it, you know, head on rather than sort of doing whatever he can without actually you know, stepping into the water and kind of getting wet. Yeah. And I think there's also a degree there of like, he really didn't get it so serious as he did get about it until it got real close to him with his son. His son was in the water with the shark, you know, in the estuary. And that's when it really set him off. Um, And it's, it's that, I think it's dealing with two of like, do you have to wait until it's like so personal to you, you know, can't just like, saving other human beings be enough for you to do, you know, everything it takes to, you know, get rid of this evil thing that's happening, you know? Um, I I think there's, there's something to that too going on. Um, because everyone progression of like the first person that dies, Chrissy is a stranger. Right. They don't know. And then the second one is like a boy, which I don't think he knows well, at yeah. least, but, like, but it relates to sort of his, and then like the, uh, whatever his name is, Gardner, Ben, like the, the boat where the corpse. Yeah. He was a friend. It implies that he at least knows him. He knows whose boat it is. And it's like the threat kind of increasingly gets closer and closer to, to sort of his own personal life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I guess like the, the moral of that would be, you know, don't wait until it's like personal for you. Like it should be enough just to like save, uh, save other people or whatever the case may be. However applicable it would be like in your life. And not a, many of us are going to be dealing with like maniac sharks, but <laughs> you know, whatever evil is happening that you see, like you don't have to wait until like it's in your house to, to try to like fight against it, I guess. Cause the marriage um, is a similar thing. Like, you mm-hmm. know, where he says like, you know, my kids were on that beach too. Like, yeah. It sort of hits him close too, where he finally, right. You know, writes the blank check or whatever it is that. Yeah. Yeah. To, to pay Quint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, I, ha- I wrote down for final thoughts, uh, another Spielberg, just a bookend, another quote from Spielberg. Jaws was f- a fun movie to watch, but not a fun movie to make. <laughs> <laughs> um, just a bookending with another similar quote that we started with. Um, I wrote down the question, is it worth the anxiety and torture to make great art? And from an outsider's perspective, I would say yes, but I didn't have to deal with any. <laughs> I just get to enjoy it. I didn't have to deal with any of it. Uh, but I do think that is a good question to ask. Like, I, you know, it just kind of makes me think about how, like how much great art 
throughout history has been made like through pain and suffering and hardship of one sort or another. Um, I, it's just, it's kind of incredible to me how like amazing, like beautifully made stuff can come out of like such like anxiety and hardship. Um, yeah, I don't yeah, know if you, you have wonder, any, you, yeah, you wonder take how many, you know, like this, the making of jaws was, you know, a train wreck and things went wrong and, and then I get led to something great and like last right. time, but like not every, you know, there's other movies that go off the rails and, it leads to this total garbage <laughs> and like right but yeah. just, you, know, you don't get the good stuff though like you know it doesn't mean for some of these artists and you know movie makers or authors or whatever you're doing it doesn't mean like it always works but just that right. that process of of you know just laboring and you know pivoting and just the anxiety and the pressures and you know sometimes that doesn't lead to good ends but sometimes you get movies like Jaws or kind of any of these other great yeah. works of art. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think there's, um, there's just a bit of like, it's inevitable when you're putting so much of yourself into something that it's not going to be easy. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. It's an interesting question to, to think about, like even like things besides art, like, my business or you know whatever it might be it's it's definitely a question to ponder but yeah did you did you have any any final thoughts before we wrap up our jaws talk um i don't know maybe Other we just we just love the movie <laughs> yeah i know i'm i'm definitely not the the very unbiased you know like for me this sure. is a 10 out of 10 movie like i think yeah. this movie is you know like people say you know there's no perfect movies and you could probably nitpick things, but like this mm -hmm. is about as close to me as a perfect movie. Like from yeah. kind of top to bottom, there's nothing that doesn't work, other than maybe that it's an old movie and the shark doesn't look real. But like, yeah, there's nothing. Like, I mean, there's not a lot of like decisions that like oh, like in hindsight they shouldn't have done this or this scene didn't right. work. Like, it's just, and I feel like it's the kind of movie that that holds up, and like almost like the more I watch it. And like talk about it like this, like the more you just appreciate why it's good, mm -hmm. like just all the little details and things that that just work so well, like just the decisions and like the this the different moments that you, you see why it is I think rightly considered one of the great movies that you know that has ever been made. Like it, right. it really is like a special you know, that I feel like maybe gets overlooked just because it's you know, monster movies, especially how we think of them mm -hmm. now, are often just the very popcorny, like, you know, shallow there's not a whole lot of other monster movies that are that are like at the quality of like a Jaws. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree for sure. Um and you'll be happy to know that I moved it from a four and a half star or nine out of ten to a ten out of ten on this watch. So oh, um, yeah. I feel like I've done my duty then if I yeah I put even I a small part and help you push it up to that that ten yeah ten. yeah it it um I just just watching it this this time around um I was just like this is just it's just so good there's like you said I I kind of agree like you could maybe quibble with like the mechanical shark but I mean what were they supposed to do like yeah. train a real shark to do their <laughs> every like bidding, you know, <laughs> you can't really do that. So, and there, there wasn't CGI. So, um, they, you know, I just think like, it's just an incredibly well-made movie. Um, and the thing is too, like I'm, I'm, I'm such a shark movie junkie that like, I've probably seen every shark movie that's ever been made. Like I just, and like now obviously you can, you can CGI sharks and you can, mm -hmm. And like, there's some shark movies that aren't that bad, but but there's you just see the difference between like Spielberg shark movie with a plastic kind of rubber big shark, and yeah. then someone else's shark movie with a super expensive computer shark, and it's just not the yeah, this is not as scary. Like even though the shark looks more realistic, like mm -hmm. 
yeah, it's an incredible feat for sure. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, we'll wrap up our Jaws talk. Um, we, uh, Daniel's going to be joining me again next week for a creature feature draft to accompany this talk about Jaws. Um, so, uh, be looking forward to that. I I'm excited for that. And then of course we'll be, um, getting into close encounters of the third kind, uh, the week after that, it'll be our, our next Spielberg film. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited for, to dig into that one. And, uh, I'm actually doing that episode with, uh, Sam camp, who's been a guest before. And, uh, yeah, Sam works with Daniel at, uh, on uh, the collision and some other projects. So, um, so yeah, it's kind of a a fun coincidence to have y'all in, uh, back to back, um, you know, films, uh, for this series. (laughs) Uh, but yeah, Daniel, do you want to share maybe where people can, can kind of follow you on socials or just follow your work in general? Where are some good places to, to tune into what you're up to? Yeah, well, I'm, uh, you can find me on Twitter slash X, uh, just at Daniel Blackaby. And then if you go to the collision.org is sort of our mm-hmm. website for our, um, for our site and kind of that's our home base. If you go there, you can find a link to like we have a YouTube page and we're just launching a new podcast in a couple of weeks, Faith and Pop Culture. Um, so you, you can find links to all the stuff. Just go to the collision dot org. And even from there, there's some links to like my Facebook and very Instagram and stuff, too. So it's probably just cool. a good a good place to go. Yeah. And uh, and like before, I'll make sure to link those in the episode notes. But uh, but I think that's that's all we have for today. Um, we'll look forward to the creature feature draft next week. Uh, but until then I've been Eli price for Daniel Blackaby. You've been listening to the establishing shot. We'll see you next time. We were happy here for a little while. But look, I think it was this way. Better to be king for a night than schmuck for a lifetime. (laughs) 